dive for the bounce back. Get your free red sock gravity deeds. It's program and light up. Do a time for die time for the socks. Do or die time for the Red Sox. You can hear it, you can feel it, as the Red Sox take the field for what their fans hope is not the final time as defending world champions. And something we will talk about, and this very knowledgeable crowd here at Boston. Remember, they since this is opening day of this series in Boston, they introduced everybody, and we'll show it to you later. The loudest ovation was for second baseman Tony Graffinino, which let him know, you're still okay, and he certainly is. Here's the White Sox lineup that's won seven in a row and has hit six home runs and has scored a five spot in each game. Scott Pitsednik leads off in left field. He had a homer his first of the season. Tadahito Iguchi had the big three-run homer off David Wells to win game two. Then it's Jermaine live and let die in right field just one for seven for the big fellow thus far. Paul Konerko has a solo homer thus far. The man that was born in Rhode Island playing in first base. Carl Everett, one-time Red Sox. Three for eight, the DH. Aaron Rowan, who will get to this, says just sat on Tim Wakefield in his career and scored three runs. A.J. Pruszynski, two home runs in game number one for the backstop. Three for six overall. Joe Creedy at third base, hitting eighth. One for six. And Juan Arebe, the shortstop, three for seven out of the nine hole, including a home run in game number one. And there is the man who... His longest in tenure and is high up on every pitching list in the history of the Boston Red Sox. That would be Tim Wakefield. Yeah, Boomer, take a look there. 28 decisions in his 33 starts. He's going to stick around. He is going to be out there, win or lose this ball game for Boston. And if they had to have somebody on the mound right now, he's been their guy all year long. Yeah, defensively, we just spoke about it. Of course, Tony Graffinino has done such a wonderful job for this club since coming over midseason from Kansas City. Except in game two, had the gap. Yeah, and 51 games with Boston this year, only three errors all year long. They talked about it in the media here. They compared it to the Bill Buckner error. Well, don't forget, with Buckner's error, the winning run scored. Graffinino did not allow a run to score on that error. And every member of the Red Sox said, hey, wait a minute now. Well said, I gave up the homer. That's exactly right. We need right. Tony to win. I mean, they, they had his back, and the crowd let him know about it as well. But Sednick. And swings to that knuckleball from Wakefield and Wakefield quickly ahead 0 and 2. Wakefield had a big second half as you pointed out Sud 8 and 3 in the second half however was roughed up in his last start. And there's the knuckler that hits but said Nick remember he was hit by pitch to open the series by Matt Clement and came around to score in game one. Sometimes that knuckleball just takes a, a hard left or a hard right. And he had good action on that pitch, but it just sailed right into Pesednik. It is unpredictable sometimes. Wakefield was talking to you before uh, game two, and he was talking about how most of the time, though, it will move right to left, and that one just got away from him. He's running, like you said, Mike. They're going to run. Stole the base in the first game, gunned down the other time by Veritek. 59 stolen base. Oh, and that ball gets away from Olaru. So even the threat of running. But wait a minute, time was called. So he goes back, and the Red Sox catch a break. Ozzy's going to come out and argue right now, but I'm guessing that it was called by Aguchi, who was standing in the box, Mike, and just felt a little bit out of rhythm. And that was quick. He said, okay, that would happen. I'm done. Mark Wagner, the home plate umpire. And let's see what happened. Yep. Took Tim off the hook there, but I still think Scott's going to run. Now 59 stolen bases, second to Figgins of the Angels. Although 50 came uh, the first four and a half months of the season. He was hurting down the stretch. And the knuckleballer, even aching legs, they were born to run. This is Tadahito Oguchi, who became infamous to Red Sox fans. And even more of a hero in his rookie year to Chicagoans with his three run homer off David Wells two batters after the Graffinino error in game number two to turn a four nothing deficit into a five four lead which the White Sox held. Well Tim's trying to hold him close obviously with the great speed but as a catcher you can't do two things at once you got to catch the ball first and try to make a good throw. The key is to stop the ball. Doesn't this remind you a lot of what happened in game one with Clement. 
that attention being divided with the pitcher on the mound. It's not like you're focused on the hitter. And a lot of times the pitching coach will tell you, you know what, let him steal second base. You know, he's not going to steal home on you. You've got to get some people out, or it's going to lead to a big inning. Well, before just going back to game one, remember well, here, okay, here's a Gucci's home run. Switch. Hanging curveball. And into the Chicago evening and into Chicago lore that quickly. 30 year old from Tokyo. Getting 278 on the season at 15 home runs and we just saw 16. Yeah, I agree, Rick. I mean, you, you have to try to get hitters out here. Scott's on base, he can run. He's going to try and break up your rhythm, attack the hitter. I mean, sometimes you just have to throw him out and, and concentrate on stopping the big inning. It's inside to Gucci. So the count is two and one. You know, Gucci, through his interpreter, has talked about how many fastballs he has seen this year. That was a knuckleball that got away, but. Mike, you gotta like having that speed at first base if you're in this situation because anything off speed, Pacetnik's gonna steal it. So you're gonna try to throw some fastball. If you're a hitter, you gotta look for it. There goes Pacetnik. Mirabelli will throw it. It's a good throw and he's out. Quite tough to gun somebody down on a knuckleball, huh, Mike? Great job here by Mirabelli. Catches the ball, takes his time, and just throws a rocket down there. When you can see Graffinino too, look at him. I mean, he had his leg in front of the bag. He was not going to let Pucsudnik get there. He's playing. I mean, he's always a guy that plays hard and does things well. He's he's got a little chip on his shoulder today. That's the key. He got right in there to make a tag. Stuck his knee in there. He had his whole body in there. He wanted to get that guy out. And you could tell. Now I'm going to ask you, Mike, because swung on a miss there as a Gucci. There's two down. Jermaine Dye coming up. You caught a knuckleballer for many years in Los Angeles, Tom Candiotti. The way Mirabelli stood up, it's almost like a quarterback making a nice throw. We'll see that yeah. in a minute. But he takes his time. Watch his head. See how his head stays still when he throws the ball, and just takes his time. Basically, doesn't do it. Doesn't try to do too much. Catches the ball, and like you said, it just stays back. Takes his time. Do you sleep less? The night before, when you know you're well, now Mirabelli <laughs> does catch Wakefield, and that's about it. But like when Candiotti's turn came around, did you sleep less the night before? Uh, I tried not to think about it, but you're right. You did have some restless nights. And Die hits it a long way foul. You know, Boomer, a big difference too, as opposed to Game One here with the men on the mound. Ozzy Guillen went to the sacrifice bunt. He told us before the game, it's just almost impossible to sacrifice bunt with a knuckleball guy. When he laid the bunt down, but Sudnik was there. That led to the big inning. They didn't get it done here. Little chopper, that's wide of third. You can see it coming out of his hand right now. There's not a whole lot of deception to that delivery, but there it is. And when he's pushing it out and he's staying behind it, there is no rotation. And with the wind blowing out, Mike, that creates a lot of movement. Mirabelli will make it official with the tag, but a hit by pitch, a thrown out base runner, and two strikeouts for Tim Wakefield. The Red Sox coming up. Yankee Way lands down street, another sellout. Up in the 230s in a row now for the Boston Red Sox. This with a little more urgency than some of the others. Terry Francona's lineup is Johnny Damon with a couple of hits in game two in center field. Edgar Renneria at the shortstop. He's three for nine. David Ortiz uh, has three hits in this series, a couple doubles. But Big Pappy, can he get moving? And there's Manny Ramirez, who's just one for seven in left field. Trot Nixon, Bill Miller, John Olerud, Doug Mirabelli, and Tony Graffinino. Your lineup. Olerud in again. He hit the ball well in game number two between Olerud, Millar, Tough choice for Terry Francona. He's gone with Olaru. And Johnny Damon got on a couple of times and first two times up in game two. Those were the innings the Red Sox scored runs. Well, an easy choice here for Ozzy Guillen, though, to start Garcia on the road. Boomer, you mentioned the numbers, how well he has pitched. Johnny Damon having difficult problems right now putting the ball in play. Garcia saying his best baseball memory was game three at Yankee Stadium in 2000. He pitched well then. 
He's a member of the Seattle Mariners where he's had six postseason outings including in 2000 to start against the Chicago White Sox and here's Freddie this year 14 and 8 but we talked about 10 and 3 on the road and by the way one of those road losses he pitched a one hitter at Minnesota on August 23rd gave up a solo homer to Jock Jones and lost he's 10 and 3 well boomer and I think that again we talked about it the advantage the White Sox had by having the division sewn up they could set the rotation as it is so important for Damon to get on the count is full the managers just love that road warrior pitcher a guy that they can go to on the road in a hostile environment and stay poised and shut down that the potent offense of Boston 17 and 4 for Garcia in his last 21 road decisions. But Damon gets on and there's the table setter that Boston has come to love these few years the defense behind Freddie Garcia. And we've been certainly impressed with the, the way Aaron Rowan among others goes after the ball in the outfield. Yeah but I think it's a huge advantage for Boston at home here in the outfield because there's so many different angles out there and another thing Boomer they don't have the extra padding here that they do in Chicago when Aaron Rowan runs into one of those walls. I also talked to Aaron about it before the game because you know we only play three games here a year you know so yes I've played here but it does take a while because there's an area and we'll look at it after this by Edgar Renneria there's an area where the scoreboard ends and it's just around the 379 sign out there in left center field but that's his territory it says that could make five different caroms off of the type of uh, the type of wall that it hits the angle that it hits it says you never get that you better be a goalie out there. It's almost like a highlight court. <laughs> it is. <laughs> In there for a strike, his home plate umpire Mike Wagner. Dale Scott at first, second baseman Mike, at second base up is Mike Everett. Dan Iasonia, Shelton, Connecticut at third base, John Hirschbeck, left field, Bill Miller, right field. Those are your umpires today for game three. Arena showing bunt, but can't get it done. One and two. Well, Edgar here just trying to just trying to kickstart that offense, get him on the board early, little bunt, move the infielders around a little bit, keep them moving, keep them anticipating. He's so good at that, especially with a runner on. Sky infield Garcia's got to get out of the way it'll be Joe Creedy and he makes the play here's one out Aaron Andrews working with us Aaron uh, pregame introductions interesting as we expected boomer Tony Graffinino receiving the loudest ovation here during the player introductions and despite that fifth inning error in game two many of the fans I spoke with today said we're going to cheer for him he hasn't made many mistakes for us and he's the reason why he's here we're here Tony Graffinino telling us before the game all of his teammates made sure to let him know that after game two and the best part of after game two his two sons were waiting for him to say hey dad good job. You know Aaron you're exactly right and you can't forget a run did not score on that error that he made it was on the mistake that David Wells on the pitch to Aguchi and David Wells stepped up yep. and said I just didn't pick him up. Well, here's a guy that can pick up the whole crowd. Big poppy. And see we've seen the White Sox play these things differently with a runner at first and less than two out. Nobody's on the outfield grass. Remember in game two guys. <laughs> Aguchi made two plays nine and a half to three. Like 15 yards on the grass at right field but he's just at the edge of it now. A lot of room down left field. They would just love to see him hit it there. And on this shift sometimes you can see the third baseman make a tag play on the runner at second base on a steal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And then you're going to see him have to bust it on a base hit, though, <laughs> so that Johnny Damon doesn't beat him to third. It, it's different. Two and one to Ortiz. He's got to do a slant back to the bag. <laughs> they need Big Poppy to, to, to slam something here. He, they've been outscored 19 to six, Boomer, in this series. Big Poppy yet to have an RBI. Swinging through that pitch from Garcia. You know, 
The Red Sox did not see Garcia this year. He's a really a little bit different pitcher than he was a year they, ago, isn't he? They didn't want to see him this year. <laughs> he has changed. He, he, he can do either. He can go either way. He can be the power guy at 94, or he can be the finesse guy. Mikey's got the curve, slider, change. Count full to David Ortiz, the major league leader in RBIs with 148. Manny Ramirez on deck. Big guns want to get things going. Well, they got two runs in the first inning in game two. Had a 4 nothing lead, but it didn't hold. They like to play from ahead, though, again. They'll give it another shot if they can. There goes the runner foul. Damon off on the three and two pitch. He'll do it again. I think this is a huge spot right here, Mike, because of the, the, the inexperience and, and the youth of the Chicago White Sox. If this offense gets going, this crowd's going to get loud and it can be devastating. Uh, it can take you out of the game early. With Garcia as well, I mean, I was interested to see what kind of pitches he, he was going to throw on his even counts and his 3 2 counts, what he, he was going to attack these big hitters with. And it looks like he's pumped up. He's coming with some real hard gas. Damon goes again up the middle. Oh my goodness. When you're hot you're hot. Double play on what looked like might have put the Red Sox in business. How about third base play and second base Joe Creedy no score. And I know it theoretically it's 425 on a Friday. Beautiful city of Boston on a summer like day with the humidity. Uh, I kind of think the weekend began about three o'clock here. I'm, I'm pronouncing it in full swing. I didn't see many cars on Starro Drive from that shot. You They're think? all here. They're all watching on the set. They all want to hear what you have to say. I think, I think the game was on, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might be. His game is on, and that would be Paul Canerco. And you know, with a knuckleball, you never know if it's going to go back fair, right? That looked, uh, that looked like a bocce ball there. I don't know about a knuckleball. <laughs> And you better run that thing out too. You don't. Yeah. It, it, I've seen a lot of times where it catches that grass. Yeah. You know, on the foul territory, and then it kicks back in. Everybody's going to get it, and now look at Olerud. He's just going to watch it. Yeah. We'll see what happens. It's like curling. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to Coco before the game, and he said his approach doesn't change with Wakefield. I, he said the only thing is that it's almost like you have to condition yourself like you're hitting flips, which is a, a sort of a drill that we do just to get your swing down. Because he, if you're too aggressive, you're just going to roll the ball past the third base coach. He told you he's going to swing at the first pitch, yeah, too. Didn't exactly. He? <laughs> he was saying, Boomer, how he, he thinks a lot of times that, that that's the best pitch. The first pitch in your first at bat off a knuckleball guy, he says, he'll take a little bit off and. and, and want to well, get ahead. Yeah. Want to get ahead in the count. You you know, as a hitter, he thinks, you know, that he's going to take a look at it. He wants to see one. Well, that's not what Canerco was going to do. Waved at that one, and Wakefield has struck out three White Sox in a row. Canerco was right. The, the easiest one to hit was the first yeah. one he saw, Mike. That ball almost cut like a slider. I mean, look at the action. It just takes hard left right there. I mean, it's in the zone, it's out of the zone. And he throws it hard, too. So it's not just floating in there. <laughs> as yeah, people he was would think. telling you the other day that he will only change speeds on it when he can throw the hard one for a yeah. strike. Time Red Sox Carl Everett three for eight in the series with two runs scored steps in. The H who uh, Ozzy moved him around a little bit in the order, moved him down to five and actually been hitting better. Right, he really didn't like it at the time. He went about a month where he's hitting 160 in that number three spot, and Ozzy, as he has done all year long, made the move. It ended up being the right move since then. Boomer, he's hit well over 300. He didn't like it, but. Likes the position the team's in now. Did that get him? Yep. Yeah, it did. So we've had two hit by pitches and three strikeouts. And uh, Francona's going to say, Are you sure? The only reason Francona's out here is because, Mike, you saw Mirabelli wave to him. Mirabelli did not think the ball made contact with Everett. It might have just clipped his shirt. 
but with with Everett on the plate, I mean, he's so far on the dish that the way that ball is breaking, it, it is going to nip him occasionally. And uh, mm. Mm. and the Oscar goes too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got him. I think he got him. I think it just touched him. I don't. I think Everett's the kind of guy that wants to hit. Yeah, I agree with you there. I definitely agree. Wait a minute. You're gonna get on base in a it's, season game? Don't you take it? I don't know. That's that's tight. Mark Wagner was a lot closer to it than any of us. So Everett is at first base with one out, and this is Aaron Rowan. And let's just show what he has done lifetime against Tim Wakefield. 714, Ruthian like average. Yes, 714 homers for the Babe, but 10 of 14 with four home runs. And we asked him why. He said, I have no idea. I said, no, come on. He said, maybe I'm just patient. And he really didn't have a great explanation, Suck. I'll tell you, moving right along with that, Wakefield's not struck him out yet either. So uh, obviously, he, he's not had the knuckleball in the past to me that he's got going here today. Seven fourteen. Mike, how about the hands of Mirabelli? I mean, you know, you talked about the throw and how he was able to catch that and handling that ball right there. How, how's he doing this? Yeah, well, Frank Cohen said he's got the best hands on the team. I mean, you saw by that last pitch. I mean, he just yeah, he just receives the ball. Hit well, Miller, Graffinino, Olaru, double play around the horn for the Red Sox. So except for two hit pitches, the Red Sox on their game. Coming along with these summer like temperatures 75 degrees and humid clouds rolling in and as a matter of fact they've uncovered the tarps they're ready for a little rain although it doesn't look like a front they talked about a front coming through here tonight uh, tomorrow is an iffy day game four we'll have here for you on ESPN at one o'clock Eastern 12 o'clock Central if necessary and that, uh, the weather here in the next uh, 24 hours potentially Dicey, but the forecast is much better than it was 24 hours ago. They were talking about tonight being nip and tuck to a rainstorm, and then uh, uh, a monsoon on Saturday. So they've they've downgraded that, which is uh, good. You can just, it has the feel though of a you know, a summer little late squall. Manny Ramirez up against Freddie Garcia. Count is one and one. I'll tell you, to me, a rain delay would be a huge advantage for Boston as well. Uh, from past experience, you got a power guy like Garcia on the mound. They're going to tighten up. Their stuff's not going to be the same. To me, Wakefield wouldn't change unless it got colder. Two and one to Ramirez. Manny just that uh, double that he played into a single in game number two that drove in two runs. <laughs> one for seven. I just love all the things that Manny does with his hair, man. I mean, remember when it was orange a few years ago? <laughs> it's Bob Marley now. That's Bob Marley. <laughs> oh, it's more exciting, Manny's hair or your ties, Mike. I look forward to it <laughs> oh, every day. Mike was mellow today oh, with the tie, huh? Mike, you backed this off a little bit. You know, New I England stodgy. One with the accountant look today. <laughs> yeah, you've been you've been confused for a lot of accountants. <laughs> he was. He was a little nervous getting on that plane in New York when we're just getting here. They got weather problems yeah. for their game tonight. Ramirez with a base on ball. So Damon began inning one with a walk. And now they begin inning two with a walk. The Red Sox have scored over 900 runs three straight years. Led the league in scoring obviously here their ranks all year long. I mean. Here's this offense that we're really waiting to see. Six runs, no homers, two games. Well, and especially here, I mean, they just wear this place out. And they they hit shots all over this park. Left, right, center. They love playing here. 54 and 27. The best home record in the majors. As Trot Nixon steps in. There for a strike. Nixon two for seven in the series. However, the other side of the coin, White Sox best road record in the majors, 52 and 29. Well, as again was talking about that. He thinks the reason is because of the division they played in and the fact that most of the other teams have big ballparks. 
his pitching and outfield defense have an advantage. Down the line, but foul. This is Dale Scott. Yeah, like we told you, strength meets strength. Road versus home wizardry. I think the Red Sox too. I mean, they've always tried to build their team around this ballpark, build their offense around this ballpark. A little speed at top, get some guys to set the table, and then have some bangers that can really uh, hit the ball to all fields here. Because even though right field is is not as shallow, there's still a lot of space out there, and very tough to play for the outfielders. Nixon taking ball one, one and two. Take a look at all the things that can happen. That ball hugging the line down there. Sometimes it'll catch that pad and kick out. It's it's real difficult to take a good angle for an outfielder, particularly Boomer. Like you said, they've only played three games thus far this year. And it's like a pinball machine out there, and sometimes yeah. you see those outfielders take some weird routes because of the fence and the different angles. Nixon swings through that one, and there's one out. You know Mike not taking anything away from this team offensively a lot of great players but you know you had a lot of success hitting in this ballpark too. it it, it can be a hitter's best friend great downward action on that pitch right there little hyped up little pumped up to start the inning but I, I noticed actually that he started off the, the next hitter with a curveball try to get back in the strike zone. Bill Miller, sorry, Mike, uh, still hitless uh, in this series at 0 and 8, but uh, of the Red Sox regulars, of the best lifetime against Garcia, six for 15. If you believe those stats over the years, 400. Again, they didn't face him this year. And you know, pitchers too. I mean, they differ from year to year. Some years um, they go with certain pitches, and in other years they go with other pitches. I mean, if if a certain sinker is working. Or they figure something out, or a pitching coach gets in their head a little bit and changes something. I've seen guys one year throw a certain pitch or have a certain tendency, and the next year be completely different. Miller, kind of an inside out, excuse me, that's grabbed by a rebay, and Ramirez back two down. You know, talking with Ron Jackson, the hitting coach for Boston, who has been there for all of those numbers, leading the majors in runs the last three years. He said the key to Garcia, we've got to make him get the ball up. Well, David Ortiz was able to do that, but no luck. He hit it right at Creedy for the double play. The last two guys that have made outs, to me, all of a sudden Garcia has gone down in that zone and they've gone fishing. Yeah, the game two and game three starter at first base is John Olaru. Who, as we pointed out in game two, the last uh, three times the White Sox have made it to the postseason. 93, they lost to Toronto. 2000, they lost to Seattle. Now, this time, thus far, the upper hand on Boston. Olerud has been an opponent. Boy, he hit the ball hard in Chicago with nothing to show for it to dead center field. Yeah, his average just it doesn't show the way he's swinging the bat. He hit a three balls, I think, really firm. Yep. Up the middle. The not play he to made defensively. Yeah. He, he's bring, he brings a lot to the team. And he could pitch too, a great college pitcher. Mm. So <laughs> if you need a lamb, <laughs> Johnny, get loose, right? Well, they've needed a left hander all year <laughs> That's long. That's true. You know? Inside. Yeah, did there for a strike, one and two. Can see, it, you know, for October seventh, the sweat, the humidity, and it, it just it, all three games is shocker. Just that, the, you know, you know, it's like Chicago and Boston to be summer-like conditions, but that's what we have that one inside two and two to all the room. Here is the runner with two outs. Yeah, I thought it was the Fall Classic, not the Indian Summer Classic. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> it's been hot. We've been out here baking. I don't expect to go through two shirts in October <laughs> baseball, but I have. <laughs> Three and two. 
Well, man, he's going to be going now. But I don't know I, what that means, but he's going to be going. You know, a huge advantage. We talked about when Damon's on or Podsednik, the pitcher's got to get quicker. He's got to worry about the runner. You, you don't have to worry about a whole lot with him. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't a step off that bad. He'll get a little further now, maybe. We'll do it again. Well, Tim Wakefield certainly has come out. You pointed out said in the beginning, the hot weather is to his liking, and he's pitched that way thus far. He was chewing that bubble gum before the game too when we we walked by, but he's he's chewing a little bit faster now. The mirrors will be off again, three and two with two outs. And Olerud has worked his way on, so the three Red Sox runners all by base on balls. And it's man in scoring position is Manny for Doug Mirabelli. So Mirabelli, who catches when Wakefield pitches. Uh, in fact, you know, Wakefield is, I told you his record this year as the Red Sox leader. 16 and 12, but he's 16 and 8 with Mirabelli. Dougie hit the first Fenway home run this year, and he hit the last Fenway home run this year. I remember when I was catching Tom Candiotti, it was funny. He always used to tell me, Look, I don't care if the ball gets by you, I don't care if you throw anybody out. Hit me a three run home run. <laughs> <laughs> the better you hit, the better catcher you'll be. Exactly. Well, and on the sidelines, and he knows, I mean, it just. Uh, you want his bat in the lineup in just about every circumstance. Jason Veritek who had three hits in the two losses in Chicago, but when Wakefield starts, Mirabelli catches. Now Mirabelli was on the DL for about a month this year, and that's uh, not to say that Veritek is not just different against the knuckleballer. And Wakefield was 0 4. You see the four starts on the DL. Can he help offensively? Takes that one and one. Aaron Andrews. Come on. Guys, when we were in Ozzie Gian's office today, Gian looked down at the uh, lineup and was looking to see if Jason Veritek was on there. He was looking, he couldn't find him, and then he said yes. And I said, Why are you so excited? And he said, Of all the players in Major League Baseball, I love to watch Jason Veritek, and I am so glad he is not in the lineup against us today. He goes in there day in and day out, no matter how unpretty it looks, he plays his butt off of course I'm cleaning it up for Ozzie Gian. you guys know that upstairs <laughs> yes we do know that Aaron but he does love a guy that just busts all the time and that would be Jason Veritek as the rain has started to come down here a little bit here at Fenway so we may go from knuckleball to pseudo spitball if it's like this you never did that did you said use the rain to your advantage Oh, I, you know, if I got a little bit up in my hand, I didn't wipe it off. I mean, I didn't, I didn't purposely put it there, but it was like, you know, there's a scuff on a baseball. I'm not going to turn it in. I'm going to use it. Foul the way. We'll do it again. Yeah, with it, if it's wet, and I don't mean at, at monsoon, but if it's wet, what do you got here, Seth? Well, you got, obviously you're going to be able to get a little bit more sink on it. Uh, they talked about the spitball back in the Billy Martin days, Gaylord Perry. Oh, you just kind of squeeze it, and you get a little bit of a, a knuckleball kind of effect. If you've got a scuff on the baseball, you obviously you put it on the opposite side that you want the movement to. That's you know, everybody at this level knows that. Mirabelli hits it toward the hole. Creedy diving, double clutches, but the force is made to Iguchi. Good play, Creedy. White Sox out of it. No score through two. Well, the organ is playing Where's the Sunshine as it started to rain here, as you can see. No score. There have been base runners, but not by hits as we begin the third inning. And A.J. Przinski to right, but Trot Nixon sliding makes the catch. Przinski has been on the ball in this series with two homers in the first game. Swing at the first pitch off Wakefield, but Nixon was the one. Well, a Boomer, a, a big part of the reason there's no hits is because we've had some outstanding defensive plays that have been made. Creedy with a nice dive, took a hit away from Mirabelli, maybe an RBI, and there's a leadoff single that Trot Nixon takes away from A.J. Przinski. Look at Trot. Maybe the water will help that hat a little bit. <laughs> or make it worse. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
You know what he told me? He said that he, actually this year he had to break down and, and put some cologne on it after a couple of those oh, Texas man. games that he played earlier this year. Deep in the hole, Uribe with the throw. It's thrown by Renteria, and he gets Creedy. What a play by Renteria, who has struggled so much in the field this year for Boston. Making the 30 errors, but that's the sort of play that we've seen him make in his career. Well, you know what? They have, as a team, struggled all year defensively. That is an outstanding play by Nixon, by Renteria. If their offense cannot get this crowd into it, they're trying to do it with their defense. Here is Juan Arebe, duh, the batter, number nine for the White Sox. He homered, one of the many that homered in game number one, three for seven with three runs scored in this series. You know, not lost on the Red Sox fans was it the other night with Graffinino on second base in a 5 4 deficit in the ninth inning. Renneria rounding out of the front. This one hit pretty well by Uribe. It's back. It's a scraper. And a double for the shortstop of the White Sox. As Paul Canerco said before the game, he says they are not going to change anything. They're going to hack, they're going to slash. And as Rick was alluding to earlier, sometimes that first pitch is the best pitch to get because you want to get ahead and throw a strike and then expand the strikes as we've talked about many times. And I think Wakefield made a little mistake right there, kind of just taking the number nine guy for granted. That's just a little cut fastball, no movement whatsoever. And Boomer, he's real fortunate it stayed in the park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mike, Mike was talking about that wall, how close it is before the game. But like Aaron said, we got to clean that up. <laughs> I don't know anything that's clean. This is new for me. <laughs> Analyzing things. Certainly not Trod Nixon's hat. <laughs> Scott Pachednik is up. Uh, it's the theme. That's just the juxtaposition to finish the story that here's Orlando Cabrera, the shortstop on these Red Sox, so last year delivering the game winning hit to late Wednesday night for the Angels over the Yankees. Renneria with the Graffinino with the tying run at second base couldn't deliver the hit with two outs against Jenks in Chicago so naturally that made the Boston papers the Jets position. The Mirabella here is going out and saying look we got two hitters to get one out basically we have a base open so you don't have to throw him a cookie here as we said earlier. You know, you but it. I think right along with that, Mike, he's going to ask Wakefield what he's thinking here. You mm -hmm. want to throw a fastball, you want to throw the knuckleball, you got the base open. But the difference to me with Podsednik as opposed to Johnny Damon, the Red Sox leadoff hitter, Damon, he drove in 75 runs. Podsednik, only 25. I got to challenge him. Wait. That will tell you something. Eight for 15. Runners in scoring position in the rebay is that right now. That's clutch hitting right there. I don't think your manager really can ask for anything more. Reaches out and goes the other way and this will squirt all the way to the wall. There's another runner in scoring position delivered. Double put Sednik all with two outs. White Sox on a board. The theme about going the other way there. Scotty just backed off the throttle a little bit. Played a little tennis with that left field line. Picked up an RBI. And as we said about two out hits, Rick. They're hard to find, boy. Very seldom do you get them. It was a knuckleball that just never came down. It actually went away from Podsednik instead of into him as normally Wakefield will get with that movement. I, I think he's lost the field court somehow between the last inning and this one. He really has not gotten anybody out other than the great defense. There's a base knock by Aguchi, and Pudsednik very quickly scores, and it's 2 0 White Sox. Terry Francona was saying before the game how Wakefield's really the toughest guy he's got to get a read on. I mean, you never know when he's going to get it or when it's going to get away from him. Right now, he's just not getting any kind of move. That's a great piece of hitting right there, a lot like the curveball that he hit out of the ballpark on Wells, but the other pitches have been mistakes. Jermaine Dye will try a hack at it. Of course, a Gucci's home run coming with two outs in game number two. Plenty of runs for the White Sox in game one, coming with two outs, including the three-run homer by Pruszynski in the first. There, that's really a stepping on the throat type of approach, isn't it? 
You know, Boomer talking about that grip, Mike. You know, we were saying before, it's not a true knuckleball. It's actually a fingertip ball that Wakefield throws when he releases it. You add some moisture in the area, it's going to get tougher. And you see these guys all the time uh, working on their nails. Yeah. Yeah. Getting acrylic nails. I mean, pedicures. It's the one, one thing they do. Not me. Why are you hiding your nails? <laughs> Die reaches out to right center field. The Gucci will go to third base. So all this coming out of nowhere with two outs, four straight hits Chicago. One two out hit is golden. Two is even better. I mean, three. <laughs> the two out theme. These guys are getting clutch hits with two outs. They're just going with the ball. They're not trying to do too much. They're not looking at the monster. They're not going for the home run. They're just seeing that ball and like I said almost almost playing tennis with it like OK it's away. Let me just put that ball away. Just tap it out there. The easy swings as well. They're not taking full hacks and their helmets not coming off and the shoes aren't coming untied. Well here's the dangerous Paul Konerko with a Gucci off third and die off first. So supposing Nixon doesn't slide and make the catch and Renneria doesn't make the play so deep in the hole. Then where are we? Oh. We've got activity in the bullpen. You know the guy that Carl Everett was replaced with the last couple of days of the year in that third spot Jermaine died came up with a big home run the 200th of the year for the White Sox in that last game and he comes through again. And Wakefield we started to tell you. Uh, pitched very well down the stretch eight and three but was touched up by the Yankees here at Fenway on the first of October in his last start. And the division series career different that really doesn't tell the story of all his postseason where we do remember 2003 how outstanding he was even though he gave up the home run to Boone and that sounds like a funny thing to say but won a couple of games against the Yankees so uh, in postseason nothing new for Wakefield this is his 16th postseason start. We'd like to close the door right here with two on, two home, two out. I was wondering right there. We saw Gucci. They're going to run it, Mike, as you said, as much as they can. I was wondering if maybe with the two strikes here, if Jermaine died, didn't think about keeping that tone of being aggressive. It'd be interesting to see if they throw down and try and throw him out or just hold the ball. Get to right field, but Trot Nixon is there. So two are stranded, but two come home. The White Sox grab the lead on Tim Wakefield in Boston, 2 0. Chris Berman, Rick Sutcliffe, Mike Piazza, Aaron Andrews with you here at Fenway. Well, the Red Sox trailing 0 2 in the series trail 2 nothing here in the bottom of the third and Tony Graffinino a nice round of applause as Aaron pointed out before the game when they introduced all the players and he was the last one you know when he introduced the whole team and you're batting ninth you're the last one out and as it will turn out they saved the best for last all is forgiven be really appreciated if he got on base as he did in the ninth inning with a double. Let's not forget that that he was on with a chance to score. They just could never bring him around with the tying run. I'll take Tony on my team any day. Stand up guy plays hard hustles. He rips this one to left so no sooner do we speak it Graffinino with the first Red Sox hit of the afternoon. That's quite a compliment Mike and also what Ozzie Guillen said after the game he's had that ball hit to him many many times people don't realize there was a lot of spin on that ball and he it wasn't hit that hard so he tried to hurry to get the double play it was just a, a human hustle mistake. Oh you're right I mean you want aggressive mistakes I mean a manager can live with aggressive mistakes when guys lay back or mental mistakes that's what really drives the manager crazy. So here's Johnny Damon the catalyst. 240 runs scored the last two years. 169 RBIs boom with the last two years. To me, that's what separates him from the other leadoff hitters in baseball. Inside. Not a not a bad time right now to, to be Johnny Damon, huh? Yeah. You're a World Series champ. You're a rock star. 
your teams in the playoffs your free agent at the end of the year. Yeah. I like being Mike Piazza. Right back to Garcia. A rebate gun to Canerco and very quickly double play number two for the White Sox. Take a look at the composure of Garcia here. He makes the pitch to get it. And there it is. He takes a look at it. Look at the crow hop in the direction where he was going to make the throw. And then how about the aggressiveness of your rebate? Boy, he came flying across that bag. And then with that arm he's got, there's, there's not much better in baseball than the arm of your rebate. Well, he made it look like Damon wasn't running. He made it look like it was somebody else, like Big Pappy. He beat him by so many steps. Little chopper Renneria, Joe Creedy at third. Over to Canerco at first. And after a hit. The Red Sox stymied and a buzz coming over the crowd. A nervous buzz. Two nothing White Sox. Two nothing White Sox here as we at the top of the fourth inning at Fenway and joining us as he's been gracious to do these three games as the manager of the Red Sox, Terry Francona. Uh, big guns who will be coming up to, to lead off the next uh, part of your inning, uh, Tito. How do you get them going here? Well, Ortiz and Manny. Hopefully you're going to see him hit about another four or five times. We just need to string some hits together and, and get him thrown out of the stretch. Um, you know, we had Johnny in motion earlier and Dave hit the ball and we get doubled off. Um, we just need to get more base runners. Terry, uh, they put some hits together, that being the White Sox in the last inning off of Wakefield. Anything to do with it starting to rain and cool off a little bit? Did, did he lose the feel? No, I don't think so. Um, I just think I think they strung hits together. You know, hit the grounder up the middle because we're shifted over because it's Wake pitching. No, I don't think, I just think he needs to get him out. He'll be all right. You take the next inning. I mean, like you told us before the game, judging when Wake has it, when he doesn't, and the next inning could be completely different than those four in a row. Huh? Yeah, and I'll tell you what, you're right. We talked about that earlier. But the other thing to remember is the incredible amount of confidence that we have in Wake. We won't forget that either. And neither will these fans here. Terry, thank okay, you very well, much. You're very welcome. Uh, gracious, the uh, manager of the world champion Boston Red Sox, Terry Francona. He's his team on the short end of a 2 nothing score right now in the top of the fourth with Carl Everett coming up. You know, Boomer, that's a good point. That's pretty much all the difference they made in that inning, putting it, putting it in play. Everett with a shot down the line, but it's foul of the pesky pole. That first pitch, the best one? That's, again, staying with the theme. Just coming around this ball a little bit. Ooh. It had the distance. Good. Struck out two guys in the first inning. He struck out Canerco to start the second, but no strikeout since. I think they've just shortened up and just trying to put the bat on. Fly to center. Johnny Damon first went out, now moves in a little, makes it. Everett out. You know, this series, as we told you, the Red Sox outscored the White Sox at the regular season by 169 runs. However, the White Sox allowing 160 less. This series, pretty simple to see 21 6 Chicago. And, and the team that makes offensive adjustments is, is obviously going to score runs. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're hitting all fields, getting two out clutch hits, working the count. They had a plan coming in here offensively. You can tell they were very focused and they had a plan and they're staying with it. That was the big advantage that Boston had coming into this series. They were the best offensive team this year. And only a couple of teams were worse than the White Sox as far as team average was concerned, but a complete turnaround. He's the guy that uh, his career is 10 for 14 but 0 for 1 today Aaron Rowan against Wakefield swinging through that one. The only thing with hitting 700 it's impossible to go higher than that. It is. It's the law of gravity. It's going to come down unfortunately. Eventually but hopefully not here for him. He's that over to the Red Sox dugout. They compare hitting a knuckleball sometimes, Mike, to like slow pitch softball. If it starts high, let it fly. It starts <laughs> low, let. Aaron Rowan, I got years from now, is going to be a great slow pitch softball player. And the thing is, too, with these numbers, when he's like, well, what's your secret? What's that? And it kind of gets in your head a little bit instead of just doing what you're doing. Sometimes you change things. Ripped by Rowan over the head of Ramirez, a one hopper off the wall. He's going to try for two. Manny Ramirez throw is wide double. Aaron Rowan. It's hard when your average goes down when you're one for two in this game, but he <laughs> hit him hard. 
the only thing he's changing is the color of that wall out there because he is just hacking. I mean, you saw the theme. It's just aggressive. He's just going after. You could play swing in every pitch. One strike, no strike, two strikes. Even with all the outfield assists this year from Manny Ramirez leading the American League, they're going to test all of the arms defensively for Boston. We were told that when this series began. AJ Przinski robbed by Trot Nixon of a hit in the third inning. He's three for seven in the series. And once again, is in the postseason. 0 2 and 0 3 with the Twins. The Giants were close last year. I'm sure the White Sox swings through that one. He uh, became only the second White Sox to hit two homers in a postseason game. Clue Ted Klazuski. 1959 in game one of the World Series of the White Sox lost to the Dodgers the only other White Sox to do it so as we said at the time the lump piece for everybody <laughs> Boomer, they just got hot at the right time Przinsky had not hit a home run in his last 25 regular season games, and then all of a sudden boom a huge blow. Two outs, a three run homer in the first inning, game one. And then there's Bronson Arroyo, a ball in the inner half of the plate, power to the opposite field, pulls it down the line. And then the home run by Puck He hadn't hit one all year, and he went deep in there. It was certainly the White Sox day, that's for sure. And you, could, you could tell a lot, too, by the, the hitter's follow through, the calmness in his swing, how well he is swinging the bat. Those two swings, he was pretty calm. <laughs> well, like you said, not not he wasn't trying to hit it out of, out of the stadium, just mm -hmm. over the fence. Inside to Brzezinski, two and two. Rowan at second base. White Sox already lead two nothing. The Red Sox, you know, they they've done it so many times. They've won eight of their last nine games. These last two years facing elimination, but you, you're tempting fate. Wakefield can't get it. Renteria over to Ola, who gets Brzezinski. But again, job done by AJ, as we saw in game two of moving the runner over. More aggressiveness, too, Mike. I mean, even if Wakefield could have caught that ball, Rowan was going to try to push the issue and put pressure on them defensively. And especially with a knuckleball, it adds a different element with two, with two outs. You had the pass ball, the wild pitch. Yep. So it's a little bit more to your advantage to, to get to third base with two outs. <laughs> Joe Creedy up. Joe grounded a short. A fine play by Renneria. So far in the hole I thought he went into the door in the green monster. <laughs> and Wakefield starts him off with a strike. Creedy one for seven in this series. The runner at third base is Rowan. And how good is Mirabelli? Well, we'll get to that. As the ball is hit to left center field, Damon and Ramirez. Johnny makes the call. And Creedy's long fly ball is an out. Rowan stranded at third. Big Poppy and company coming to the plate. Welcome back to Fenway Park. Hood is making strides by supporting the American Cancer Society's Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walk in Boston, October 16th. Visit Hood.com for more information. One more reason you can feel good about Hood. The Hood light ship. We thank you for the great pictures. The aerials here. Happy hour in Boston. Will it be happy hour on Friday afternoon for the Red Sox? It was for this fella in exactly this spot, except up 2-0 last year when he hit that extra inning home run that started a party that went all October when the Red Sox beat the Angels on Ortiz's two-run home run in game three of this ALDS on a Friday afternoon, and we were here inside. Yeah, Boomer, we remember. We remember he did it to the opposite field, too. It went up over the Green Monster when he ended that series. This one is a monster shot way up in the air. Back goes Aaron Rowan as far as he can go. He can't go that far. Good. So many of his. 
his home runs have either tied or put the Red Sox in the lead. This doesn't quite do that, but it makes it a whole nother feel here at Fenway. Long ball, Big Pappy. His and the Sox first in this series. One of the things that makes him such a great hitter is that he doesn't try to pull for every pitch. He's got power to the opposite field. He plays pepper with that wall. And just sits back, crushes that pitch. I, I, I thought Aaron Rowan was going to catch the ball by the way he reacted. He just kind of started drifting and drifting, and then finally he took off and it looked like he was going to climb the wall. And he was 30 feet from where that baseball you know, landed. Way up in Koenig's corner as Manny Ramirez fouls this bag. And that'll get people juiced here now. You even mentioned the homer against <laughs> Washburn last year, and he delivers. They, they didn't know they got cable down there at the plate. <laughs> I'm telling you, and these two guys feed off of each other. Well, you know, whatever Big Poppy does, Manny wants to do better, and it's and it's in a competitive type environment where it's good for their team. Uh, you know, we gave you that number, and they've got the back to the wall, and they've won all these elimination games. The general manager Theo Epstein, who has done such an unbelievable job here with the Red Sox, obviously, said history doesn't win games. And which is true. And they need guys like Big Poppy and more to deliver. The White Sox have given all they can handle. Austin on the board. And Freddie Garcia is two and two to Ramirez. And a team that's struggling too, sometimes you need a spark. You need something to inspire you, to get guys off the bench a little bit, to get that chatter going in the dugout. Ramirez goes to right field. Back it goes. Back, 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 back. This is gone. You have just seen the thunder and lightning that the American League pitchers have seen for several years now. Ortiz and Ramirez, who combined on 92 homers this regular season, have gone back to back and we're tied at two. I've never seen a hitter lock in another hitter. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, to hit the ball the opposite field of homer, and that shows you have to be on the plate, look the other way. Trot Nixon swinging for the downs. The swing goes high and out of play. Base side. Well, when you hit as many as those guys hit, they're, they're going to know when it's gone. Man, he easily knew that ball was out of the ballpark. Look at the, I mean, he doesn't stop once, you know, the playoffs begin. He normally gets better. The MVP of the World Series a year ago, the dynamic duo. It's hard to believe that they only did that once during the regular season, back to back home runs. That's nice. He spread it out, it makes it even feel worse. So those two guys have gone long ball in different directions. What did Terry Francona say? Hey, we just need to get something going. Even without base runners, those guys can make it feel like we have a rally going. Now Nixon to right field, but not quite as far as Die is there. And one is out. Any B and Manny right here. <laughs> You just want to loosen those gloves right away. They, they really kind of, they're like a tourniquet, huh? <laughs> that, that's the thing. I mean, the best hitters always have their gloves real thin and real tight. Because you want to have it almost like that golf glove feel. You don't want to have so much thickness or so much interference. You want to feel the bat. You want to feel that ball hit the bat. And hit the ball the opposite field. You have to really keep your head down on the ball and let that ball travel. That's the first two home runs of this series. Tells you how good the pitching for Chicago has been. You don't see a lot of right handers too go around the pesky pole. There aren't many obstacles in the ballpark that the man will take on. That's true. Little Miller looking for his first hit of this series. Two and one is Garcia to him. You know, Boomer, it's just mind boggling to think about. Over the last two years, Manny and Ortiz have combined to either score or drive in 944 runs. I mean, that's unbelievable. 
Over 100 runs scored every year, over 100 RBIs, almost 150 RBIs for both of them this year. It's an obscene number, actually. 2 2 and Miller just gets a piece of it to stay alive. I wish I could relate a little bit more to those. <laughs> we can. Put I up know. numbers like that. <laughs> you never played in Fenway. Yeah, that's true. What are you thinking with Dodger Stadium and Chase to that? Those are great pitchers' parts. Yeah, they are. It doesn't make it a. You have to hit the ball very well to get it out there. Okay. And you know this guy's going to wake up here. Billy Miller now 0 for 9 in the series. The tough part for me to believe is that he struck out three times. He's normally a guy that puts it in play. Always had that high on base percentage, but added the extra base hits when he got to Fenway and he found the Green Monster. Popped up in the infield. Uribe. And Miller has gone two down. Big boys with thunder here in the fourth have tied it at two. Watching Manny hit that home run just makes me think how important it was what Ozzie Guillen did in game two when he went to his closer, Mike, in the eighth inning. He said, I, I want my best up against their best, and it worked. And you don't see a lot of two inning saves anymore. That's. That's a flashback. Oh yeah, particularly for a guy that just got to the big leagues this year and just developed into being their their closer. I think there's a lot of closers out there going, what now I gotta throw two innings? <laughs> <laughs> That's where you gotta be careful with older Rue. He's, he's normally a you know an optic field guy, an on base percentage, takes a lot of pitches. I've seen him in this spot. He'll look middle in and try to hit it out too. Tailing back, just catching that inside corner. One and two to all. The thing about Johnny, if he doesn't like it, he's not going to swing it. <laughs> Very patient hitter. Side all the route two and two. One time batting champ at Toronto in 1993 at 363. I mean, I've never seen a guy go from an 0-2 count to a 3-2 count. Uh, literally. That quick. Looks like he moved off the plate just a little bit for this pitch. Rebay it short to Canerco. Gone. But not until David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez hit back to back homers to tie this thing at two. Stand way behind pesky pole here at Fenway. White Sox two, Red Sox two, top of the fifth. Swinging right away is Juan Uribe. Coming a long way is Trot Nixon. Now has the time. One up, one down. You know, Tim Wakefield he came over here to Boston in 1995, signed uh, then. All of a sudden was third in the Cy Young Award voting right away, was 16 and 8. And now through the years, you wouldn't think, okay, on this Red Sox team of which, oh, by the way, Cy Young. Roger Clemens, Louis Tiano just came to see us in the uh, in the booth and say hello. But here's where he ranks: second in games, third in starts, third and wins, third in strikeouts with with all those pitchers on that they've had here. Well, how about that? Only Roger Clemens and Pedro Martinez with more strikeouts than Wakefield, and only Roger Clemens and Cy Young with yep. more wins. Pretty good. Good. You wouldn't think that, would you, with Tim Wakefield? I right? know he's been around a long time and he's played for five different managers here in the Red Sox and. He is uh, he's seen it all even part of those teams that have all three of those teams that we talked about at the outset that came back from 03 or 02 and right there Wakefield now being treated to a new game again comes right in and registers two outs. Mike we talked about momentum you know you get those two runs you tie the score up as a pitcher you want to get out there as quick as you can and get your offense back in the dugout he's two thirds of the way there. Here is a Gucci. Just to complete something else about Wakefield, we'll get it here. You know, after he gave up the home run to Aaron Boone and pitched so beautifully in that 03 ALCS to the Yankees, 
he wasn't sure, you know what, am I going to be bucked? We talked about Graffinino. And he was found that it would be far from it. Everybody knows in Boston what he's meant. He had to give up that homer. He was applauded when he went out to eat with his family about three days later. He knew it'd be fine to close out here. Back here at Fenway, 2-2 game here in the bottom of the fifth. The White Sox and Red Sox and gracious again to join us as he has all three games. White Sox skipper Ozzy Guillen. Ozzy, you guys had Wakefield on the ropes there for a while. Uh, then all of a sudden, is the approach change or what are you telling them to say what worked a couple innings ago? Well, you just make it to a strike and uh, just go and relax. Don't try to do too much with the ball because right now that ball is moving a lot and uh, it's, you know, it's tough to put a bat on, his, in, on the ball. Ozzy, you had three strikeouts in the first two innings, but when you scored the two runs, everybody did put the ball in play. Do you shorten up your swing? Do you change anything? I think you have, they have to go there and relax a little bit, make sure they make contact. Uh, the way they're blowing wind, the wind blowing right now, I think they, uh, they're going to help him. You know, Ramirez and Ortiz hit homers off everybody. Freddie still look pretty strong to you? Yeah, I think Freddie's on the ball real well. I think I worry about a little bit as a uh, pitch count. I think it's uh, really high in pitch count, but you, the long and keep-ups in the game, uh, I think we're going to have a chance. Okay, Ozzy, thank you very much. All right, guys. These guys are great to join us. I mean, they got other things to do, to be quite honest with you. As uh, we begin here in the bottom, of inning number five, Mirabelli, Graffinino, and Damon. Probably the fielder's choice in the first inning is, uh, you don't want to call him a caddy, I guess you do. You know, like Steve Carlton had Tim McCarver and Mark Fidrich had Bruce Kim among the famous caddies, and there are others. Greg Maddox always seems to throw to a different one, and Doug Mirabelli. It's also a way to give a catcher an expected rest, right, Mike? I mean, okay. <laughs> Ver Veritek knows as in a long season I'm going to get a rest every yeah. five days. Well, managers don't want to get into that situation to where they have a caddy or a certain catcher catches a certain pitcher. I mean that's what they really try to avoid but unfortunately sometimes they have they have no choice. I mean they're left with just that Jason is not comfortable you know catching Wakefield and, and like you said it does give him an opportunity to get a rest every now and then. I thought it was a little interesting too when Ron Jackson talking about Mirabelli probably the best on their team at picking up maybe a, a, where a pit an opposing pitcher is tipping his pitches or you can see the breaking ball he does something different with his glove. Uh, we got word back that they thought Matt Clement in the first game was tipping his pitches how he went in to get that uh, that's it might explain some of the problems that Matt had in that game. Well, by the way, we said Veritek arrest. Did you see that shot 30 seconds ago of him? I mean, he's not playing, so he's resting, but he's walking up and down uh, there like a general talking to his troops, isn't he? You know, a little different, too, because he's normally down in the bullpen on the day that he does not catch, but he, he's right there in the dugout for this one today. We'll see him tonight, I'll bet. Creedy across to Canerco, and there is one out. Creedy much more solid at third base. Joe's had a couple of interesting plays. A good player at third, but he's had a couple of interesting games the first two games. But very solid here. Is the pitch count Garcia? That's up there, isn't it now? Five innings? That's up there a little bit, but I tell you what, he he caught a break in the fact that he has not pitched since last Thursday when he pitched the clincher at Detroit for the White Sox to win the American League Central. After throwing 228 innings during the regular season, though, he he, he deserved that extra rest. Tell you what he always gives, as we talked about with Burley the last game. 33 starts, 26 of them six innings or more, 19 of them seven innings or more. It's good numbers, very good numbers. Burley, who pitched, uh, just hung in long enough for his offense to get going in game number two. You, know, you get a good look at Ozzy too up there on that top step. And when a pitcher starts to fatigue, his breaking ball starts to spin and, and it's elevated. And uh, the velocity could still be good, but if you're hanging the off speed pitches, that's when all of a sudden that pitch count gets to be important. Ozzy on that top step to take a look. And sometimes as a manager too, you want to you want to go against the grain. You don't want to just go with the book every time. If you see a guy struggling a little bit, you want to leave him in there, see if he could figure it out. I mean, even in a playoff situation. Hit well by Graffinino, but he just didn't quite get the barrel on the ball. And uh, out the left field, there are two outs. Uh, of course, we continue with game three coverage of the ALDS. The Angels and Yankees move on to New York for game number three. Randy Johnson on the hill tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern time with John and Joe and that crew. Paul Bird going for the Angels. That series not at one game apiece in the ball yard in the Bronx. 
And what I was saying too, Rick, I mean, yeah, I love when managers say, hey, I'm going to go with the guys that got me here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, obviously, you're going to win the game. You want to win the game. And if a guy's struggling a little bit, you want to some guys have that quick hook or they feel the pressure to get that quick hook but sometimes you have to let them figure it out. I, I thought that was Terry Francona's key last year. He stuck with Johnny Damon. Obviously you're going to stick with him but he also stuck with Bellhorn. They're into the latter part of the Yankee series and into the World Series and Bellhorn caught fire offensively got them going and you know you, you, you dance with the one that you brought and that's what Francona did. And, that's part of the reason they won the world championship. Well, and that's part of what was really grinding at him was he, you know, Oldwood has gotten two out of three starts at first base, and Millar, Kevin, has been such a big part of this Red Sox success in 03, before Terry got here in 04. Certainly the power numbers weren't the same this year at all. They've been kind of waiting for him. And you know that he said that was a hard choice. Older Rudy, I mean you understand why, so the knuckleballer defense and Oldwood's been on the ball, but he likes to go with the guys who brought you here. Millar will have his moments in this series before it's over. I just know it. I know it. And it's their role to stay ready. And it's their role and it's their job to, to, to watch the game and, and chip in any way possible. And there for a strike to Damon. Count full now. Johnny thought that he walked again here as he did. In his first at bat, just catching the bottom of K zone there. Krasinski had to bring it back up to the zone, but it's not where he catches it, it's where it crosses the plate. Eddie Garcia with a full lather going. 2 2 game here. Do it again to Damon. We were talking about the pitch count. Uh, Obviously here at Fenway Park where Boston has such a uh, an advantage I mean you're going to throw more pitches you're going to throw more pitches to try to nibble a little bit especially with two strikes because you know a mistake or something that stays in the middle of the plate can still end up off the wall. Popped by Damon. Reba and Creedy will give it a look. Well, there you go. Boomer right there. There's another part of the reason that the averages here are a lot higher than they are on the road. There's, there's no such thing as a foul ball that, that's caught. Almost everything here is either in play or it's in the stands. Yeah, a lot of good pitches here still get put into play, and some of them wind up, you know, hits. Remember before they made all the changes at Dodger Stadium, man, you got a lot of outs in all of that territory that they had. They need it out here. And Damon plunks one in, and he's heading for a second as the ball just kind of dies there on Jermaine Die. Double with two outs, Boston. Kind of went over there and got wedged under the wall, although Damon was going to get two anyway, but there was no rebound at all. And so Boston in business with not, two outs here in the fifth. Not hit hard at all. It looked like a little cut fastball just down there. Nice on the outer half of the plate. Damon putting it in play. And with him being on second base with two outs, to me, that makes Edgar Renteria such a, he's so much better in this situation, Mike, where he can go to the opposite field rather than trying to hit a double. Hey, look, let's put it bluntly. We saw Ortiz and Ramirez at solo home runs. Renneria get on in any way and now you bring up the big boys with runners aboard. It's his job right now. Yeah, he'd like to drive him in. I'll take an excuse me chopper to just get on or maybe stick your your ankle out the way by accident. And big Poppy awaits his turn next. Well, see it comes right into the street. And a pitcher knows sometimes when you have an aggressive hitter, as I was saying earlier, you can go ahead early and try and expand the strike zone, try to throw a two strike approach pitch with the first pitch, knowing that he's probably going to be swinging if he's aggressive, but obviously here trying to get on base anyway. And those are those numbers that sometimes you look at. How aggressive is the guy? How many times does he put the first pitch in play and try to use that a little bit to when you're scouting a team? in scoring position that's been a, a, a negative for the Red Sox thus far. Although with Ortiz and Ramirez they're runners in scoring position when they step in the batter's box. One of the positives for Freddie Garcia down a stretch here and one of the things that he, he did 
to have the success. He, 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 the pace in between pitches, Boomer, got a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And to me, right now, all of a sudden, he's starting to slow everything down again. And you see the infielders and outfielders taking their glove off, kicking the dirt. He doesn't have that rhythm that he had earlier. Like we said, just get on, especially a walk. There's no place to put Big Poppy. Count is three and one. And a little stirring in the White Sox bullpen, a fine one. Rousey didn't want to have to go to it at this point. Not missing up, but he's missing out of the strike zone with those breaking balls. And that, that's what got him to this point right now. Interesting what his pitch selection will be with Big Poppy on deck. He gets it. Ball four. So with two outs, a double Damon, a walk to Renneria. And here comes David Ortiz. The major league leader in RBIs with 148, and he homered his last time up. And a visit to the mound for the pitching coach, Don Cooper. In the fourth inning, down 2 0. Ortiz stepped up to the plate to lead off, and he hit Homer. And the chain of MVP is out again. We, you know, David had three hits the first two games. They weren't the. With the Ortiz like but boy, that one was just deep to Kadig's corner and then Manny down the right field line. Remember we talked before the game. I thought a couple of the keys that may have gone unnoticed in the first two games were two trips to the mound. In the fourth inning, it was Ozzie Guillen that went to the mound. In game two, it was Cooper that went to the mound that turned that momentum around. There's some guys that can turn things around. Well, Ruth and Garrick turned it around and hadn't been done since Ruth and Garrick twice. Those back to back seasons you just saw by Ortiz and Ramirez. And now here is David. Man, think about that. He kind of got him for a song from the Twins. 31, then 41, then 47 homers three years here, Boston. We were saying, I mean, to drive in 148 runs, you obviously can't drive yourself in every time. These are these, these are the situations that he excels in, and has excelled in the whole year. Runners on base. Hits this one to right center field. Back goes Rowan. He's got room. And he makes the catch about 405 feet away from home plate. Big Pappy thought he had it, but deep part of the park, we've stayed tied. Welcome back to Fenway Park. Yes, the tension as the Red Sox try to stave off elimination once again. Trailing the White Sox 2-0 in this ALDS. Trailing in the game 2-0 until Ortiz and Ramirez hit homers in the fourth back-to-back. -back. We begin the top of the sixth with the heart of the White Sox lineup. Jermaine Dye, Paul Konerko, Carl Everett against Tim Wakefield, who has retired the last five White Sox. Wake, once upon a time, an infielder. Long, long time ago, when he was an eighth round draft pick of Pittsburgh in 1988. Over a year and a half, New York Penn League and single A, and he said, you know what, we're going to go to knuckleball after that. And he broke in in 92 with the, the Pirates. They just missed that one, huh, Ortiz? <laughs> Manny says it's a homer. <laughs> Well, he saw him do it, what, 47 times this year? Freddy Garcia thrilled with the result there, but knew that he made another mistake with that breaking ball. El Duque up throwing, huh? Orlando Hernandez. I think more than anything, he's just getting some work in. It, it, to me, it's past his time as far as pitching in the game. The one thing I would look for is for Ozzy. Maybe to get a left hander up and going. Take a look at what happens with Manny. If Manny gets on, then you got the left handed hitting Trot Nixon. You got the switch hitting Bill Miller. Then you go left again with John Olerud. If he feels like Garcia is starting to lose it, he'll have a left hander ready. Field. in there to 
Mark Canerco, it's 1-1. One one. This to, to finish up in 92, he came out of nowhere. Pitch for Jim Leland's Pirates. Beat Tom Glavin twice in the postseason. And his career was underway, although then out of baseball and the majors a couple of years. Resurrected here in Boston in 95, and now he's on all those lists. And here's a list. Canerco sends it high and deep to left field. Ortiz and Ramirez aren't the only guys in this park that have had back to back 40 home run seasons. Paul Canerco has as well. He's gone deep for the second time this series. You know, and as Coco was saying before the game, he said he just wants to put an easy swing on that ball. And he, like I said, he let that ball travel and just just put the barrel of the bat on the ball. And Mike, it's almost like he knew the ball was going to break away from him. That ball started out yeah. like almost at his left shoulder, and he said, I know if it goes anywhere, it's going to go towards the plate. And like you said, elevated, put some air under it. Nice play, Olerud on a shot by Carl Everett to pitch to Wakefield. Yikes. Hey, what, just like the letdown that Manny Ramirez had, you saw the reaction on the ball that Ortiz hit when it didn't leave the yard. It's almost like this crowd had it, and Wakefield took it to the mound with him. He walked, died, wasn't close to the strike zone, and then he gave it up. And Francona going to the mound, which is usually the sign of a move. But with Wakefield, you never know everybody in to discuss it. And he's going to make a move. So Tim Wakefield gets a big ovation. But he's gone on the short end of a 4 2 stick. Back here at Fenway Park, the hook has been given to Tim Wakefield. Terry Francona, as we told you before the game, saying that would be maybe the toughest decision that he had when to pull Wakefield. But. The decision to bring in Chad Bradford to face Aaron Rowan is not that hard. Rowan won for two today off Wakefield. Now 11 of 16 lifetime. And although his average falls from 714 to 698, <laughs> this move you can understand. No question about it. The, <laughs> those numbers are absolutely ridiculous. But right now is where Terry Francona has got to manage. He's got to keep the energy up in the dugout. And I love what he did there. He waited till the last minute to have Veritek run in from the bullpen knowing that we'll probably see his bat in the bottom of the sixth. Well Mirabelli with the normal catcher's glove now back there but Bradford serves up a single so I mean you could have Cy Young pitching to Aaron Rowan and apparently he's going to get a hit. Well I think Bradford might be done. He was he was in to face one hitter. Yep. Francona back out and you get the other side winder. Well, that's right you come in you get all warm you come in one pitch you give it up. Now is it Myers? These guys are hurting themselves out there in the pen. Here at Fenway where Paul Canerco's home run has given the White Sox a 4-2 lead here in the sixth inning. And Chad Bradford, one pitch, one single, he's gone. And now the sidewinder from the other side, Mike Myers, is in. And that's what we meant by they were hurting themselves. They can't warm up. They have to take definite sides of the bullpen. <laughs> when they warm up, they're going to hook arms, right, Mike? The bullpen's not that big down there. I wouldn't want to catch down there because the ball is coming from the other side of the rubber. The opposite rubber from which you're lined up. Well, you know, Przinsky doesn't really want to hit here either. He's 0 for 3 off Myers with three strikeouts. I look for once again, as as, as Ozzy Gian told you, Mike, before the game, Plan B to stay aggressive on the base pass. They got Wakefield out now. I look for them to run, even with the left-hander on the mound. We know by the way that he plays center field that Rowan moves well. One of a handful of White Sox with double digit stolen bases. He had 16 regular season. Rowan with the lead now too. Ozzy again, you know, house money. That's true. I mean, most teams are more aggressive when they're ahead. Obviously, when you're behind, as I've said, you don't want to run yourself out of an inning. You want to give your guys a chance to swing the bats and get back into the ball game. So when you're ahead I've always found most teams are aggressive go for it why not take that extra base steal a base.
That was off by a drink. Boomer, what was so remarkable about last year in game four, they were down by a run. When Millar walked off of Mariano and Dave Roberts went in, instead of protecting yourself, as a lot of managers will do with the sacrifice bunt, Papelbon up and throwing, he could come in to face the next hitter. Terry Francona, when Dave Roberts went out, Roberts went to him and said, What do you want me to do? He says, I want you to touch home. It wasn't any sign. I mean, you're on your own. You get it. And he took off on the first pitch. Then they didn't bunt him to third. The base hit drove him in. This might have come from the dugout here, throwing over as much as he has to give Papelbon time to get ready for the next two right handed hitters. And a way to contain the running game is throw over. <laughs> I know the fans don't like it. It brings down the pace of the game, but you have to throw to first base. You have to hold that runner. Oh, one to Pruszynski. In on his fist for a ball. I mean, I always laugh sometimes when I put down the throw over sign and I hear the fans. Oh, boo. And I'm like, wait a minute. I got, I got to <laughs> stop this guy. I know you don't like it, but uh, I have another. Uh, I have another refreshment. You got a job to do. You really have to pay attention Absolutely. to these guys can run. Myers, early birds it outside, two and one. Here's that opportunity to run right now. He's, he's got to look at his move. He's seen the high leg kick. He's seen the slide step. Krasinski with trouble putting the ball in play. Maybe you help him put a runner in motion, get the infield moving with a hit and run. Swing defensively. It's the count of two and two. The only thing he got in motion was Joe Creedy in the deck <laughs> circle there. That, that was close. Just a bit tardy on that swing. But when you're swinging the the bat well too, you're not afraid to get jammed. You're you're not afraid to get jammed. You're not worried about breaking a bat because you're seeing the ball well. You're letting it travel. Oh boy, that almost took out some photons. But it went off the bunting off of uh, in front of the tarp. The White Sox telling me last night, you got the three stooges here. You got Joe, and, and you got Poe for, you know, Przinsky being of the Polish background. And then you've got Roe down there at first base. They say it lovingly. You know, Ozzy, he's going he's gonna to put a nickname on everybody, but. Uh, I don't know anyone else that does that, do you? No, there's your three stooges. Where's Larry? <laughs> Where's Larry? And they love it, too. 2 2 the count to Persinski, but Myers will take a look at Rowan again. Boston. Yeah, they're. One read, you make a few pitching changes. Wakefield and Bradford and Myers don't exactly you know, work like they're double parked outside the ballpark. And the guys kind of standing around a little bit. They got to keep this thing at 4 2. There goes the base runner. And a throw by Mirabelli. It's not going to be in time. Got a big jump, did Rowan, and had a breaking ball, obviously, to work with and stolen base. And that's Ozzie again all of the way there. Even the guys in the dugout saying something to him about being aggressive. He got a read on it with two strikes. Myers paying attention, trying to get the strikeout. Krasinski lays off the pitch and hey roll right now he, he may start thinking about stealing third base after he picks up second. And again to steal second base off the left hander you have to go first move there's not a lot of guys that have the speed enough to make up for a flat footed jump on well, left hand left hander pitching. Off again Krasinski how good have the White Sox been we've showed you with runners in scoring position. Have done what uh, well Boston has done all year. It's been the White Sox, pretty darn thorough thus far, and the champs are on their heels. And that's what we call clutch hitting. Clutch hitting will win you ball games. Big hits, big two out hits. Guys that know what to do when runners are in scoring position, home runs. Four to two, the White Sox here in the sixth inning after Chicago led it to two nothing. David Ortiz led off the fourth inning with a solo blast to dead center. Manny Ramirez, a solo blast to right. The champs were back in it, but Paul Conurco, who lived the first 11 years of his life in New England, till six in Rhode Island, and then moved to Connecticut till he was 11. It was dad the Yankee fan. It's interesting that the White Sox looking for their first 
postseason series victory since they won the World Series in 1917. There's a story here, but here's a full count pitch first. Maybe. The digits he remembers as a youth. The last four digits of his home in Rhode Island were 1917. Hmm. Q Rod Serling, please. Coincidence? Huh? I don't think Apparently. So. <laughs> Apparently not. Brzezinski <laughs> draws a base on ball. So there's a guy that had struck out, as you point out, Sutton, all three times against Myers. And by fouling off all those pitches, he does a great job. He has done little things well in this series, hasn't he? Sutton? Well, and it's the little things that Ozzie Gein has done. The pressure and the fact that they might run drew the attention off of A.J. Brzezinski. Again to the pen. We'll be back. Now the fans at Fenway hoping that the Red Sox have that magic once again. But they have allowed two runs home here. Wakefield has been knocked out. We've seen two relievers now three come in here in the top of the six. Now will be the wunderkind if you will Jonathan Papelbon who pitched in game number two in Chicago one and one third pitched well gave up two hits but uh, he was a godsend beginning the day in the year in double A. Going to Triple A on July 4th. Called up a couple of times. Stayed on the big club mid-August. Became a reliever. Now all of a sudden, uh, good a setup guy as they have. And he's working to Joe Creedy, who's 0 for 2. Creedy wasn't one of the guys that he faced in Game Two, but one of the guys that Papelbon did see was Paul Canerco. And Canerco, along with hitting coach Greg Walker, came over to talk to Creedy before he went up there. Maybe give him just a little insight as to what to expect. Sometimes like with a guy like this you don't really want to know. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell me he throws an 88 with a split and a slide. Yeah, exactly. It's not good news. Ooh, that's it. Well the foul. Canerco had a good at bat though. He yeah. just missed it. Remember when he hit it to the warning track mm -hmm. in center off of Papelbon. No but in all seriousness I mean it does help. You want to know what the guy throws how the ball moves. Maybe there's a little tendency like you said maybe there's a, a tell that he. That he tips just a little and, bit. And hearing those conversations, Mike, a lot of times they'll say, Who does he remind you of? Yeah. You know, somebody that Creedy may have seen a lot, but as you said, thus far, not a whole lot of help. Applebaum ahead of Creedy 0 and 2. He'll do it again. And the White Sox. Thomas Marte and Dustin Hermanson up throw. It's been a long inning. And, uh, you know, Freddie Garcia with all of the pitches may have started to stiffen up a little bit. As close as they are, Ozzie Gian and, and Garcia, he, he may have been honest with him and said, you know what, it, I, I'm not going to be the same if I go back out. Away, one and two. Almost got away from Mirabella. He, he was standing up. That's one. Of, that's like the old shots of Yogi Berra when he used to catch. Man, looked like Josh Gibson there. Did you see that? The way yeah. he, was, he he actually yeah. was standing straight up on that pitch. Yeah. Well, Veritek will do that from yeah. time to time when he wants to get the ball up. Up the ladder. Way to Creedy. We told you that he missed a couple of days the last week of the regular season. As uh, he and his wife, uh, second little baby girl, went home to help. Here it is. I think I want this pitch up, <laughs> up the ladder, and he almost threw it by him. But you're trying to give your pitcher a visual. Got it. Didn't have a visual there though. It was Mark Wagner, the home plate umpire. There's no way he could have seen. Well, the longer the White Sox stay alive, the less diaper duty that the Joe will have to do. We'll delay it for a couple of weeks. Talk about incentive. Just playing. We can't wait to get home. They'll take this alternative. That's motivation. That's yes. Motivation. <laughs> Pretty's work is back to two and two. And he's staying alive. Trying to figure out what to do here. Mirabelli going out. He, 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 to me, it's a lot like Mike the bat with Przinsky where AJ was fouling those fastballs off, not pulling off the breaking ball. It looks like Creedy's got the same approach. You know what? It's been 20 minutes since Canerco hit his home run. You know, that came in this inning. I know you may not believe that. 
In that situation too, you know, I tell all the pitchers, I tell all my young pitchers, old, if you don't know what you want to throw, come out, ask me. If you have a second thought, let's talk about it. Two on the white side. Look at Creedy hold back on that one and pull this to full. But two runs home, two runners on. The Red Sox cannot let this get away. As Uribe, a dangerous hitter in the nine hole on deck. Four for nine in the series. To right field. Nixon to the line. Boy, that's a tough area. Did he grab it? Yeah. Tagging. And up to third is Rowan. Boy, Trot Nixon's made a couple of fine plays. That was as difficult as it gets. He probably got the wall right in the ribs. It was right at the corner. There's no way a visiting right fielder could have made this play. Only three games the White Sox have played here. They would not have known you could have come to that corner. You could have gotten over the fans. The Red Sox fans pulling back. Look at the attention there. He knew where the wall was. He's made that play before. Good hustle, good base running on the part of Rowan, but just an outstanding catch to get that second out. Jermaine Diagon, wow. <laughs> I don't have to make a play like that. Not to say he couldn't, but that is difficult. And now here's Uribe. And they're going to say, did he leave early? No. The appeal play might as well try it. I, mean, I wouldn't have seen any reason to leave early on that play because I mean you got a guy running into a wall. I mean he, 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 he's fine. There. That's just they're, they're just begging right there, trying to get a yeah, call to get this thing over. But you know what? Uribe has been <laughs> an, an offensive force as much as anybody for the White Sox thus far. Now well, he's doubled in this game, one for two, four for nine overall. When you get that All kind one. of production out of your nine hitter, I mean, what, what more can you ask for? Well, four for nine. He, he scored yeah. four runs. He's got three RBIs, and we're not even through the third game. Jonathan Papelbon trying to end this rally here. The fourth pitcher this inning for Boston. And misses there up top. Now the crowd annoyed just at everything. Well, they were upset with the 3 2 pitch to Przinski. It wasn't called. This looked like it caught the outside corner, but just off the edge. There's a foul ball. White has been pretty consistent tonight, though, hadn't he? I he's mean, he's good. certainly not been as wide as Miller the other night. Well, they have every right, Mike, as you know, to yell from the dugouts because all they can see is the height on it. They can't tell if that was on the plate or not. They knew it wasn't high and it wasn't low, but it was clearly just off the corner. Yeah, you used to have you probably had signs with your manager, didn't you, when you were catching whether it was a strike or not, or no? Yeah, well the problem is sometimes the umpires see that as well. <laughs> and they get mad at you. Now two foul balls have even it to two and two. Sometimes, like I said, like I was saying earlier, I mean you can see the strategies are different here with Wakefield. They're really aggressive here. They're trying to work the count. They're trying to really work those close pitches and make them make a quality pitch. Everybody up here at Fenway, they know they got to get out of this. Foul back again. Not only working the count here on Papelbon, but they have already worked three relievers out of the Red Sox bullpen in, in just the top of the sixth inning here. So, what an approach offensively by Chicago. I mean, I've never seen so many. Hitters spoiled great two strike pitches. I mean, it frustrates you as a pitcher. You know, when you're making a great pitch, you snap off that great slider with two strikes, and the guy spoils it, it frustrates you. There goes the run of the bluff throw, and uh, alertly, Przinski steals second just to see if he could bite a throw from Mirabelli. Mike, plan B? Yeah. Huh? Exactly. Stay aggressive, even exactly. with Przinski? And with the first and third situation there too, I mean, a throw to second base is risky. You got two outs. I think that Rowan might have taken off if there would have been a throw here. I think he thought about that double steal. Yeah. All right. He, he was baiting him there. Yep. Wait a minute. Now we had Pesetnik didn't hit a homer all year. Hit a homer. 
Krasinski didn't have a stolen base all year. Got one. So they're getting it from everybody, and just a bleeder could make this 6 2. Well, and to me, they've gotten three straight up to this point perfect games out of their manager. He has not done anything wrong in this series thus far. That's heads up, too, by AJ. I mean, you're mm -hmm. not paying attention to me. You're not looking at me. I'm going. Rowan off third. Brzezinski off second. Two down, full count to the dangerous Juan Uribe. Swung on and missed. Maybe that's the lift that Boston needs, although Paul Konerko lifted one himself over everything for the 4-2 Chicago lead. And now the Red Sox are down to potentially four innings left of their reign as world champions. Speaking of reign, Manny Ramirez, who homered his last time up, will step in against Freddie Garcia, who sat during a 25-minute inning. And how, what do we expect here, Sutton, Mike? 25-minute delay. We saw 90 miles an hour in that first pitch. That's down about four miles an hour from what he has to, to begin with, but... We saw a strike. We saw it down in the zone. You know that Ozzie Guillen is paying close attention. Manny hits this back, 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 back. Gone! An absolute missile by Manny Ramirez has made this a one run game. Still at 90 miles an hour, that velocity is okay. But Mike, we talked about the key being the breaking ball. That was a slider. It hung up in his eyes. I would be real surprised if Freddy Garcia gets to throw another pitch here tonight. And what, and what can you say too about Manny? I mean, hit home run to right field, home run to left field. It's almost too like the phones in the bullpen weren't working because Canerco had to ask their main die if the reliever was ready down there. Ozzie Guillen did not get a signal. He got Canerco to take his hat off saying he was ready. We're going to go that way. And so we won't know except that Manny Ramirez touched Freddie Garcia. Did the delay hurt him or was it just too much Manny? One run game in Boston. Back here at Fenway Park, the sixth inning has claimed both starters. Tim Wakefield out and now Freddie Garcia out. The lefty Damaso Marte, good but gets off kilter sometimes. Up against the left-handed hitter Trot Nixon, 0 for 2 today. We know he's got live stuff here, guys. The ERA, though, up near 4. Look how resilient he's been, though. Again, 66 appearances this year. I thought it was interesting what Ozzy said before the game. I, I thought he was going to bring Marte in to face Ortiz in the seventh inning of game two. And he said, you know, I really don't want to use him at home. The fans are hard on him. They boo him. He's better on the road. So the whole team's better on the road. The team better. Garcia better. Marte better. Nixon, how about the play that he made down by the corner in foul ground there? To register a key out. In the top of the six and into 25 minutes and now Nixon hits one almost to that corner right base hit track so here come the Red Sox one run in already on an absolute bomb by Ramirez and now Nixon the tying run is aboard pitching summary of the two starters Tim Wakefield who could lose it Freddie Garcia who could only win it Freddie into the six Wakefield five and a third you see their lines. Garcia with no problems at all, at all today other than Batman and Robin. He made three pitches to Ortiz and Manny Ramirez. They hit three home runs. Now Bill Miller. This would be a big time for him to come through with his first safety of this postseason series. Time called for Marte went into his windup. That's key here for Boston because as I said. Sometimes the most important out of the inning is the first. Now you got a base runner with no outs. In there for a strike to Miller is Marte, the 30 year old left hander from the Dominican Republic. In the bottom of the order, you can see uh, the Red Sox, other than Graffinino, have been awfully quiet. We know they're better hitters than that. Up top and outside. 
One and one. Nice job there on the part of Trot Nixon. He took off right in the middle of delivery for Marte, and he lost his focus and even the count back up. Let's see if the Red Sox want to get a little bit aggressive. Nixon runs okay, and Miller can put the ball in play. Not a move, my Billy. Mike, there was that big swing, you know, and no contact there. He's got to shorten up as the White Sox have done. When you get that filthy breaking ball, you got to get a piece of it like they were able to do. He's trying to go deep here. There's nothing wrong with that, but now, better forget about deep and try to put something on it. Whoa, way outside, almost uh, got away from everybody. And as it happens sometimes when you're pressing just a little bit at the plate, your head's moving around, you just get out of your game. You can see by that replay his head his helmets you know and you have to just bring it back down and look up the middle and try to hit the ball at the middle. Rip a foul. I will scatter him down on the photography's uh, photographer's booth. Well obviously in this day and age you play many more postseason series than they did in the old days. But yet here are the postseason home run leaders. Manny's two has broken his tie for second with Mickey Mantle and Reggie Jackson. And has put him behind only Bernie Williams, who's had so many postseason runs and home runs with the New York Yankees. Now Miller has worked it to three and two on Marte with Olerud on deck. It's hard to knock out the champion, isn't it? Even when you have him on the ropes. Inside, Miller aboard. A tying run goes up to second base. Fenway is alive. Down to Aaron Andrews. Guys, just to let you know, obviously Manny Ramirez allows his Red Sox dugout to breathe a sigh of relief. Now with Billy Miller walk, they're clapping. They're having a good time. Looks like the captain's going to come in. Jason Veritek pinch hit for Doug Mirabelli. Also, Papa Jack, Ron Jackson, Boston's hitting coach, telling me before the game, he told Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz it's time to bring it out. He said they both looked very locked in. He said especially David Ortiz, you can see it in his eyes. Guys? Locked into three home runs tonight, Aaron, that's for sure, as the pitching coach Don Cooper is on the mound to talk with Marte. Well, we knew that uh, eventually we'd see Veritek, especially with Wakefield out of there, and well, that brings a bigger stick down to that part of the lineup. So he's in the on deck circle. Olerud is up. And again, El Duque. Uh, Orlando Hernandez. They started this year, but gone in the pen. You don't know. We see him for a situation. He went through two great innings the last day of the year in relief. He came in and saved that ball game. You've got to have a lot of faith in El Duque. He's been a big game guy. But here's where you need faith in Marte. You bring him in to get the left hander out. He couldn't do that. He walks the switch hitter. I Olerud doesn't have a sacrifice bunt all year. But very few of the Red Sox do, but I think Mikey's going to be patient here and make Marte throw strikes. Yeah, he's got a great eye. He's really going to shrink that strike zone here. Oh, for one with a walk is Olerud, and he starts that one off with a ball. Nixon at second, Miller at first. Ball two. Yeah, that strikes on is tighter than we saw yesterday, but uh, game two. But, but but it is very consistent. Yes, guys. Mike called it. it, it it's a shoebox right now. <laughs> well, Ozzy, Ozzy's trying to open it up a little bit for his pitcher. Yeah, Ozzy doesn't feel like the middle of Marcos. He's not looking for shoes. He's looking for a bigger <laughs> play. Old Rude fouls it off. That's a good swing. Yeah, he just missed it, but still. It's pretty simple to see what uh, what he's saying about the pitch before that, or something like that. Isn't that what he's saying? And what a pitch is struggling here too. Again, you know he's going to try to take something off a little bit to get in the strike zone, and sometimes that's a great pitch to hit. Well, it's a good thing that's a thick helmet that Mark Wegner, the home plate umpire, is wearing because Ozzy's trying to decibel him out. Three and one, Olerud. Four. Home run, single, two walks, one run in. The bases are loaded, and Veritek will come up to pinch hit for Mirabelli in the eight hole. 
I really couldn't think of a better hitter to have in that situation than Johnny Olaru because he has such a great eye. This 2-0 pitch. Hey, let me go ahead and try and ambush him. Let me see if he's going to take a little bit off the pitch and throw it down the middle and try and give us the lead. Got then, underneath it. Wasn't yeah. going to hit it on the ground. Yeah. And then he brought the strike zone back, back to a, a stamp. Well, Marte has not done the job, and here comes El Duque, no stranger to games at Fenway. Back here at Fenway, the Red Sox are threatening to tie this thing or maybe go ahead. Ozzy Guillen, seen enough of Donaldson Marte, and he has brought in a guy that he helped A to help Contreras, B to perhaps, hey, postseason, this guy's been there. So Orlando Hernandez, El Duque, who pitched uh, for years with the New York Yankees in a couple of stints there in the postseason. This will be already his 18th postseason appearance, and he's come in with the bases loaded and, and uh, Jason Baratek coming up. And the reason they're loaded is because this crowd got to Damaso Marte. He walked the last two guys. El Duque will be able to handle the crowd. The problem is, can he handle Baratek? Veritek three for eight in the first two games. Obviously not getting the start here because Mirabelli catches the knuckleballer Wakefield. Timmy is gone. Veritek in. Against El Duque, though, no good, at least not till now. Very seldom will Veritek swing at the first pitch, he says, when he's out there in his first at bat. That's when he starts the game. This is a little different here. Nixon, Miller, and Olerud lead off. The bases. Ramirez is homer. Has already made it a 4-3 game. These are one of these situations where you want to minimize the damage. You'll take a tie here. You don't want a big inning. You want a crooked number on that scoreboard. Looking for that ground ball double yeah. play if you're El Duque. Holds off that one. Trying to pull the string. Ball one. Remember Aaron Andrews telling us what Ozzie we heard before the game. I don't want to see that guy. Well. His issue is with the umpire at this point, Wagner. He's trying to wear him out. And, you know, you got to be, it's tough. Postseason, a lot of rabbit ears or stuff from the dugout. It's a tough call when to run and when not to. If you're the umpire, still going to want to just run on complaints on balls and strikes. But. They're looking at it from the side. They see the height of the breaking ball. They see it cross the strike zone. Ozzy absolutely lost it right there. I mean, he was above the top step. He, he, he wanted to come to home plate. 2-0 to Veritek with the bases loaded. Swings through that one, strike one. There's still some pretty good arm strength in El Duque. I don't know how old he is. It doesn't matter. And then again, you see Ozzy arguing on that side, but on the Boston side, they're saying, hey, wait a minute, we could still, we can be more patient. We can shrink them up a little bit more. He's listed at 36 years of age, we think. Veritek skies it. Canerco calls Brzezinski off, makes the grab. Big out there, just one gone. And now you talk about a chance. All right, you talk about a chance. He's he certainly hit the ball well ever since that miscue in game two. But Tony Graffinino can erase it all right here. The spot. Our job, Mike, is to be impartial, not care who wins. <laughs> but when you got a guy that's is, is I mean, you just can't have a better person than Graffinino. And when this happened. I mean, your, your heart goes out to him. He tried to hurry on a double play. It got away. The lead got away. The game was lost. He's got a chance now to get that lead back here. He's on it. Held it up back. Yeah, and these are one of the, this is one of those atonement situations to where. You can't let your emotions get the best of you as a hitter. You got to calm down. You got to try at least keep the ball off the ground. He can run. I think one thing too, he's, he's got to remember, you don't have to swing the bat here to drive in a run. Yeah. I thought Veritek expanded his zone yes. 2 1 and got himself out. One and one. 
And the few times I faced up, Luke, I mean, so tough on right-handed hitters. He has that slider that just drops off the table. He could take something off on it. He could put something on it. Different arm angles. Oh. He, he gave me fits. Okay, ahead of him, one and two. What's, what's coming here, one and two? Well, again, he could do one of two things. He could either try to come inside off the plate, move him back, or throw that good, hard two-strike slurve slider. I wouldn't take a chance inside here, but he could do it if he wants to. That is a great take right there. Mm -hmm. You've got the crowd. You've got yeah. in the back of your mind what happened in game two. I think so, I'm rolling that one over. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it gets most people yeah. out. Well, Tony's got a good short stroke, and he likes the ball in, so I think they know that as well. They're going to try and probably make him hit the breaking ball. 2-2 Two -two pitch. Do it again. Red Sox with Ramirez leading off with his second home run of the game here in the sixth. Knocking. Freddie Garcia out as Trot Nixon now at third. Billy Miller at second base. John Olerud at first. One out. Two and two the count to Tony Graffinino with Damon on deck. Common there. Well, the toughest thing about this situation is you're in a defensive mode. You're in a defensive mode, and the pitcher knows this, and he's trying to, to get you to chase a little bit. Doesn't want to give in. Doesn't give in there, and now the count is full. Ozzy's working up a while, they're just watching and screaming. This is a tough situation because if you throw it 2 2, you want to throw it 3 2. You got the feel for it, but you got a left hander on deck, so that goes out the window. Foul that. We'll do it again. This is this is at its best right now. I mean, this is guy a guy making great pitches. You got a guy in there battling, fouling pitches off. This is good stuff. Yeah. Orlando Hernandez has been a Good pitcher long before he got to this country. Cuba. Escape. Pitched here with the Yankees. Yeah, what he went through getting out of Cuba is a lot tougher than yes, what he's going absolutely. through. Now. Payoff pick. Protecting a little bit, might have missed it, but you can't take the chance. That's what Graffinino's thought. The thing you don't want to do in this situation is try to think along with him. You don't want to think, well, it could be a slider, a fastball. You don't want to get in a guessing game with the pitcher. You just want to see the ball and hit the ball, no matter what the pitch is. If you anticipate, you might chase. Up over the roof and out of the street. Nick the car. Tony might have helped him, helped him uh, out a little bit. That pitch might have been a ball up yeah, in the. That was the zone. first one that yeah. it's been coming out of his hand. It, it, it looked yeah. like it was a ball. And <laughs> <laughs> that's a lather, all right. I got to admit, I, you know, Mike is sitting up here with the booth, and I don't mean to be trapped, but you've been through so many of these gut wrenchers, but you haven't really sat in the stands or in a yeah. booth for that much. You're, you're nervous oh, up yeah, here, I'm aren't you? I mean, I'm seeing I'm you move it. around like this. I'm this I'm is like, funny. Yeah. And that's what this, we're right in this situation, too. I mean, you know, I'm out there. If we, I have a doubt, I'm going out and talking to him. What and do you, you want to throw? Think right along with him. To me, yeah. Brzezinski went out there and said, you know what, can you throw that breaking ball for a strike? Yeah. If you can, let's 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 go with that. If not, then we've got to keep pounding the fastball in there and hope he hits it at somebody. And you're icing the hitter a little bit. Stoney's been aggressive and swinging the bat. He's got to really concentrate. 
Pops him up as well. A rebate calls for it at short. They are high that? fiving at home plate right there. I think Krasinski talked him in to that breaking ball because El Duque coming back there to back up home, high five the catcher before the ball was even caught. Mike, they went with the breaking ball. Take a look at it. Even though he's sitting in, there's a breaking ball. It fools Graffinino. He's out in front. That is a big time pitch. That is, that, that's special. Ten pitch battle. And now, bases loaded, none out. It comes bases loaded, two out, and Johnny Damon up. You better not relax. Johnny, Johnny one for two in a walk. Makes him three for 11 this series. Slow, tantalizing breaking ball in there for a strike. I tell you, watch El Duque. He is a he is a pitcher. He is not a thrower. This guy knows how to pitch. Takes a little off, puts a little on. He goes up in the strike zone, down in the strike zone. is tough because now you have two outs now I want to go back in the dugout with the lead here so you might get a little anxious and throw a pitch that you may not want to throw sooner or later they got to come through with runners in scoring position you would think huh I mean this solo home run thing is fine which are all three runs for them today two Ramirez one Ortiz but Boomer, when we set this series up, we talked about the best pitching staff in the American League and the, and the best offense. And right now, up to this point, the pitching staff has been much better than the offense for Boston. Here's a guy that can do something right about it, though. Johnny Damon. Ooh. Waved at it. Two and two. They're late on that fastball out of respect for El Duque being able to throw the breaking ball for a strike. And if you notice that 3 2 pitch that graph popped up, he really pulled back off the throttle a little bit. So you're going to be feeling for the ball. Ooh, away. You know, they wanted that. But now comes the best moment in baseball when everybody's moving. Three balls, two strikes. Two out, Nixon at third, Miller at second, Olerud at first. Start your engines roaring. Or restart your engines. Man, I'm excited here. I know you are. That's my point. I'm watching I'm you. Around here. You've been in how many games in World Series? And so is he. Jonathan Pappelbaum finally quelled the White Sox. Everybody's been on their feet for about five minutes here. And another conversation. Now what, Mike? Well, he's going to ice him again, like yeah. Mike talked about. This is Przinsky here. They, they talked about how he took over the staff, and he did such a great job from day one in spring training. He's, he's doing a great job here. And we were talking about before the game with Ozzy, with sometimes with the signs, you want to make sure you're locked in. I, I'm going to go out here right now and go, what are you throwing? Sometimes I, want, I won't even put a sign down. I don't want to. I want to make sure I know what pitch is coming. Baseball here, they know it there, and 3 2 pitch. Oh, he gets him to go. And the White Sox, El Duque, goes charging off as well he should. He comes in with the bases loaded and gets Veritek, Graffinino, and Damon. Yeah, just enough. 4 to 3, Chicago.
What a sixth inning that was as we begin if you're a White Sox fan a seventh inning stretch. In the top of the order but Sednik Iguchi and die. A sixth inning in which seven pitchers worked through 73 pitches that took 58 minutes. Renteria over to Olerud and Pacetnik is retired. Now here's the fans with everybody up for the pitch first with Damon. And <laughs> like we were talking. Tight. Tough being a fan is as much as a player, especially these Red Sox fans. But well, they're playing. Some could still say they're playing with the house's money this year after last year. But uh, don't tell those folks that. And a lot way to go here. Red Sox will have three more cracks at it. And the youngster Jonathan Papelbon just trying to keep things at bay. Came in, retired the last two in the sixth, and retired Pacetic to start it. And here, Gucci at two and zero. Oh. Remember a huge advantage for Chicago from this point on as far as bullpens are concerned. Papelbon, he, he's, he's out there for a while. Really the only thing left for Terry Francona that he wants to use in a game he's trying to win is Mike Timlin. Mm -hmm. You're not going to bring Gonzalez back in. You're not going to bring Bronson Arroyo and you don't know if Clement can pitch or not. Renneria. Olerud. Two out. Aerial shots courtesy of the Hood Light Ship. Matt's Backlund, Catherine Board. Mike Wolf on the camera up there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, you turn late afternoon into some threatening skies into a pretty nice evening here in Boston. And the Hood Light Ship kind of withstood it all. Worried about that ship up there when Manny hit that homer. I didn't know where it was. Yeah, I know. It was. Uh, that was an absolute launch. Canerco's was impressive, but Manny's was ridiculous. It's got that certain sound, like a two by four snap in half. <laughs> Jermaine Dye looks at ball one, one and one. And so Boston has the big boys coming up: Renneria, Ortiz, and Ramirez. It's like another night boomer of those 24-year-olds. Yep, Papelbon and Jenks. Is guys that were in double A until July, who we saw play prominent roles in game number two. Jenks, the old fashioned two inning Crowley Fingers like save. And Papelbon, who pitched in game two to try to keep the Red Sox close, which he did. And now the same thing here in game three. Although Francona would prefer to use him with a one run lead, he would go either way. Down 2 0 in the series. This is no time to say, well, I'm only going to work him with the lead. I don't think so. You talk about momentum. Boston trying to get it back. It's one thing to get it out here and have a 1 2 3 inning, but it gets a little bit better when you get that last out via the strikeout. The crowd wants it. I think offensively, Boston needs it. Now, the way again. Certainly part of the Red Sox future right here with Papelbon. They don't know what part of it though. They still right. don't know whether he'll be a start starting that. pitcher or he can he might be their closer a year from now. Seems like he's comfortable in the relief role. Yeah. Well, he made three starts earlier and they first brought him up, but then hey, we need you in the pen. And so there he went. Saw Keith Folk in the clubhouse before the game. He had another, the other knee surgery yesterday. Disappointing year for him. I mean, he was so good last year down the stretch and then all the way through the playoffs. Inside to die. Well, they say that they expect him to be ready to roll for spring training, but you know, who will be with him? In spring training, a lot of decisions to make. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. We're not going to get into all the decisions they have to make, but this could be the last day or so for several of these Red Sox, depending on what Theo Epstein and the front office want to do. 
chopper to Graffinino. Olaru, Chicago has gone in the seventh. And so the White Sox lead it four to three. Manny's gone yard twice. Ortiz has gone yard once. They're coming up. Seventh inning stretch time. Back at Fenway Park here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Orlando Hernandez, El Duque, nothing short of spectacular when he came out of the bullpen in the bottom of the sixth with the bases loaded and nobody out. And against Jason Veritek, got him to pop it up foul. Against Graffinino, he pops it up in the infield. And he and A.J. Przybski with the fist. And Johnny Damon gets him just to twirl. What a job. Unbelievable the confidence he had to throw that breaking ball to both Graffinino and Johnny Damon there with the count full. If, if you don't throw it for a strike or if Damon does not swing at it, it, re it results in a run. It would have been a tie game, but what a big time performance from El Duque. Gutsy. That's gutsy pitching right there. And the, you know what? But you're as good as what? Your last inning. Like, great job. That was great. By the way, Ortiz and Ramirez are coming up. You know what? And gutsy to go to him, too, because, uh, you know, Polite's been outstanding down there. A lot of other options for Ozzy again. Viscaino has been there. Hermanson's there. You've got Jinx to close it out. He went with El Duque. He added El Duque to the roster rather than Brandon McCarthy, who was outstanding down the stretch, and he knew what he was doing. Al El Duque pitched for years in the postseason with the Yankees. You're looking at the closer, the 24 year old Bobby Jenks. And speaking of El Duque's old team, the Yankees, they come home 1 1 with the LA Angels of Anaheim with the big fella, Randy Johnson, on the hill against the Angels, Paul Bird. That coming up a little more than an hour from now as our division series coverage continues. That should be special at Yankee Stadium. We saw the weather down there as well, but. The big fella having a chance to pitch for the Yankees. And again, if we have game four, we'll have it for you right here at ESPN. We don't get much of a turnaround. One o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Central. That's 10 a.m. brunch, West Coast. Edgar Renteria. David Ortiz, Manny Ramirez to face El Duque. Mike is at high socks. Sorry, so tough as El Duque was with the bases loaded, he was throwing out of the stretch. How much more difficult is he with that big leg kick? But don't ask me. I, I do not have very good numbers against the Duke. The Duke. Is it hard to pick the ball yes. up? I mean, just yeah. I, I never like facing my face him a couple times in the Subway series. Look at that. Even with a 2 0 count at the knees, outer half of the plate. I mean, it's, it's a, there's the deception. Where's the baseball? There oh. it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought that was a strike. Two and two. And it's not even so much as the, the stuff, the pure stuff he has, it's the way he delivers this, his attitude, his demeanor on the mound. Here it is, hit it. He's aggressive. He strikes him out. Renteria gone. He's 0 for 3. And now Big Poppy, David Ortiz. Homer to deep center field in the fourth inning. Lined into a double play to the third baseman who was playing behind second base on the shift in the first. And just missed a home run in inning number five. Well, now this shift. <laughs> okay, now everybody's on the outfield grass. That's the shortstop Aribe, and so deep second base you can't describe it. Except that Aguchi is just as deep. Look at that. Those are infielders, folks. You ever see anything like this? Uh, I've, I've seen some alignments like that. I just wonder how many times they practice catching ground balls where they're at right now. Hmm. Bust that one pass, and by throwing it down to third, you throw it down to second <laughs> on that shift. Wow. 
five up, five down against El Duque. They struggled with throwing that baseball around a lot like David Ortiz struggled with that high fastball. That, that's some kind of pitching performance we've seen up to this point. And he's shown you different looks. I mean, here's that hard, hard slider. And guess what? I got some gas for you upstairs. It's tough. You have to be you have to be locked in. You have, really have to be locked in to get uh, to get a good swing off this guy right now. Yeah, Manny Ramirez had a good swing off everybody else. Two homers in his last two at bats. He walked before that. Four three game here in the bottom of the seventh. Champion Red Sox facing elimination. Their big guns have come out blaring. Will it be enough to extend it? In there for a strike. He's got plates extended a little bit. I'm not saying that that pitch was not a strike, but it's a lot bigger than it was what it was in the last couple of innings. Ozzie Gian may have gotten his point across. I'll tell you another thing, Boomer. If he gets this out right here, the season offensively may be over for Ortiz and Ramirez. I'm just looking back at El Duque. Yankees won the series in '98, postseason two and zero. Yankees won the series '99, postseason three and zero. Yankees win the series in 2000. Mike remembers El Duque three and one. Hello. Not awed by this as you've seen today. Big game pitcher. Oh, and he's healthy too. I think so. He's healthy again. Manny Ramirez, who's homered twice. This says El Duque. I'd like to take that resume and deposit it about 400 feet somewhere. Again. Staying alive. Chris Berman, Rick Sutcliffe, Mike Piazza, Aaron Andrews down on the field. We've seen a good one as the White Sox taking it to the champion Red Sox, trying to eliminate him in their home park. High fast Long ball. ball, Boston. Two by Ramirez, one by Ortiz has gotten him to win 4 3, but the two run homer by Canerco was why the White Sox lead. An outstanding relief pitching by El Duque right here. Two and two. And he's such a good breaking ball hitter with two strikes. A lot of times, Mike, I think he looks for it. I look to see him go back up the ladder like he did Ortiz for strike three here on Manny. Yeah, he did that early, and I was watching him curiously to how he was going to approach Manny, and it looked like he was going to come out of aggressive, and he did with fastballs to try to speed up that barrel a little bit to make his curveball or slider effective. Well, nervous, but they know that they can erupt in just a moment. And it's drama almost every game, you know, 10, 9, 11, 10 regular season. Shot to Canerco, but he'll gobble it in. Ramirez is gone. Six up, six down against El Duque. Two innings left, perhaps, in the reign of the Red Sox. Time now in Boston as darkness start to fall on the champions who will forge one of the great stories of this or any other year no matter who you root for breaking the curse from 1918 with comeback after comeback but now maybe it's the White Sox who haven't won a world championship or a series of any sort since 1917 they are on the brink of providing their long star fans a win that they can talk about and pass down through the ages. Paul Canerco, whose homer put them in this four to three lead, pops this one up against Papelbon and one pitch and a one out. If you join us late, White Sox led early, two nothing, but then David Ortiz leading off, followed by Manny Ramirez, home runs in the fourth. But then Paul Canerco. Off Tim Wakefield pretty much finished his evening. Make it 4 2. Manny Ramirez then coming back. But El Duque with the bases loaded strikes out Johnny Damon in the sixth inning to keep the game at 4 3. And that's where we stand right now with one out in the eighth. What a job done by him. And you know that this is not to make an excuse. Boston could come up with two runs and win the next 11 games. But you just wonder with what they've been through, guys. 2003 was a gut wrencher that went all the way to seven in the ALCS with the Yankees, even to extra innings. 
last year obviously a gut wrencher with the comeback of, of mammoth proportions this year not clinching a playoff spot until the last day of the season and then again not to make an excuse but could they just be pretty low on the tank what do you think you guys have been through it in that in that situation Mike you have no oh, no question I mean it you're right sometimes the thrill meter <laughs> runs empty and and you need big moments and you need big hits I think Mike too right along with that I, I think the starting rotation ran on empty for particularly most of the second half you knew Kurt Schilling wasn't going to be the same OK Wakefield has been consistent Bronson Arroyo has been pretty good but when Matt Clement got hit in the head with the line drive in Tampa from Carl Crawford he was not the same down the stretch and when you think about them sweeping the Angels last year in a division series they had Pedro Martinez Schilling and Derek Lowe that got it done. That being said they ran into a buzzsaw of a team that has won their last five regular season games that won ninety nine games second only to the Cardinals in the major leagues that won their division led their division wire to wire who obviously a lot of people underestimated so in no means am I downplaying what the White Sox have done but you know when you're the champ and you've been to a lot of 15 round prize fights sometimes you right there's just that that right hand uppercut well, just tough. isn't quite the uppercut it's tough because you constantly have to dig down deep and find something and find that 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 big hit like I said and it's so difficult sometimes. Well, time to do it that's for sure Mike I think with that dig and I think what we found we, we found an MVP type player in Paul Konerko we found a gold glove type player and Aaron Rowan AJ Przinsky has taken his game to a whole nother level and ladies and gentlemen meet the Chicago White Sox. Two and two to Carl Everett. Over to Miller who's feeling so well but at the bat has uh, not come through here yet Boston in this series is two down and uh, on the bench presented by ING this is what's left we already used the both the catchers I mean you you're not really going there it kept, except for Millar in a long ball situation perhaps well, I don't know who he would do hit for but you know there's Kevin who is like Bill Miller Damon is the big name Kevin Millar Billy Miller they're up along with Damon along with Manny I mean it, you know that that's a soap opera that we don't have time to go through again will that you know so what will be the makeup of this team they change it a lot this year how much will it change next year or possibly you know after the next hour if this season ends. I'm still I'm sure that Ozzy as well is uh, thinking you know I wouldn't mind an extra run or two in this situation. This game is far from uh, out of reach. And Rowan who was impressed. Two for three today four for nine in the series not to mention his defense and crashing in the walls. Stolen bases. They've just gotten contributions from everybody. Aguchi, Patsudnik. When you look at Boston, there's only been a couple of guys doing anything for them, particularly today. But I think we're putting a curtain down on a thing here for the Red Sox. This crowd. Yeah, there you go. Boy, Papelbon has come in and retired all eight batters he's faced. Can Boston tie it up in the eighth? thing about these division series is sometimes they're over before you realize that they've begun the Red Sox uh, clinching the postseason the last Sunday of the season just five days ago going to Chicago the White Sox hang 14 on them then come from behind to win game two five four and now Boston down to six outs left trailing four three in game three here at Fenway Trot Nixon Bill Miller John Olerud do up against El Duque who has just 
He's just been unbelievable. Six for six, the first three with the bases loaded. Well, the three guys you mentioned coming up, I mean, uh, great offensive players, but not as good as the three that he went through so easily in the previous inning. El Duque, hey, you know, Ozzy, he talked about getting the whip out with us the other night. You know what? He's He's got a pretty good horse out there right now, and <laughs> he's going to ride him as long as he can. Yeah, a lot of managers really go with the hot hand. Go with the hot hand. <laughs> well, I mean, he's a starter, so yeah. we're not worried about all tiring him out. Yeah. Uh, hey, they, you know, they could end it here. They would not play again till Tuesday. And there's Jenks and the left-hander Neil Cox up in the bullpen. The trot nicks it. Oh, what a diving play by Canerco over to El Duque. Defense again, White Sox. That's some kind of play Mike. I mean he's guarding the line for the double look at him and watch how far he goes. Look at the dive. Look at him coming up with the in between hop. El Duque hustling. You think El Duque didn't like it. Look at that. What a big time play. He gave him the lead with one swing of the bat. He helps keep that lead with one dive. Seven up seven down for the Red Sox against El Duque. Here's Bill Miller. Broken bat. And boy, Billy with another offer as Aguchi grabs it. You don't see a lot of pitchers really fire up the team, but that's what El Duque's doing here. I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's extracting emotion from his fielders. These guys see him out there like, hey, he's giving us a gutsy performance. I'm gonna lay out for him. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on my toes. He just kind of turned around yeah. and looked at him yeah. too, like boys get ready because yeah. you know what? I'm throwing more strikes. Well, and you, you think about how long that inning took and how much everybody was standing around and this and that, and the other thing. All of a sudden the pace, everything's changed. Well, you think a lot about like offensive and igniting the offense, but but you know, when you get a pitcher out there who's doing what he's doing, it it, it charges everybody out uh, off, you know, up in the field as well. John Olerud swinging through it. And one and one. They've talked about one of the lack of emotion that the team really has. Overall, they're a bunch of quiet guys, other than their manager, and other than the guy that's on the mound right now. But they're very tight unit. They're friendly, if that's a, I don't know if that's the right word to describe them. But, uh, and that's ripped foul by Olerud. And these are the battles that. These postseason battles that draw the team closer together, that get that energy going, keep it going. You know, there was a sign on the Red Sox door as we walked out. It says, The fat lady hasn't even thought about singing. You know what? We just we heard a little bit of Sweet Caroline. I think I think she might be standing up right now. No, says third base umpire Dan Ayasonia. Olaru did not go around. The count is two and two. I don't know what song she's going to sing, but well, that was close. It's not going to be well received, I'll tell you that. That shows the action here. on his pitches. I mean, to get a good hitter like Johnny Olaru to fish a little bit. And Olaru to center field. Rowan won't play it. Base hit Olaru. He's walked twice and gotten a single. So there's the tying run aboard with two out in the eighth and now the captain Jason Baratek up and Olerud will be pinch run for. Alejandro Machado is the pinch runner for Olerud. Now we talked to Terry Francona about that. He said I don't have a Dave Roberts on my bench anymore. This guy is the fastest guy that he's got. He said, no, I'm not going to just turn him loose. We might pick a spot and put the, the, the steel on, but he will not be on his own. The captain, Veritek, was the first man that Orlando Hernandez came in to face with the bases loaded and got him to pop up in foul ground to the first baseman, Conurco. That was back in the sixth. Here we are with two out of the eighth. Busted him in and got a nice shot on that one. Yeah, and as, as you said, Rick, too, I mean, yeah, you'd like to score 
uh, steal a base here, but then you run the risk of taking the bat out of Veritek's hands, and you do want to give him a shot. Del Duca has done that now, only three for 29, Veritek against El Duque. Rollerud only hit nine guys that he faced today. One and two. Can the Red Sox get a little late magic once again? No one's better at it than them. But the margin of error, as you're seeing today, is pretty scant. Fouled away, Veritek right below us. Did you have that one, Bill? I was ready, but I, I, I was counting on your hand. You were on top of it, buddy. I missed this by what, about six feet? A dive would have had that, you know. It, you were anything. You're still a little sore. So <laughs> you realize that's part of your job. Right? I know. No, I got you guys. We don't make you carry the you. backpack with a bubble gum, but <laughs> something comes in here, it's on you. I had it. I had it. I, I saw, saw it. it. One and two to Veritek. Uh, the pinch runner at first with two out of the eight. Four three Chicago Red Sox. Four outs away from elimination and the end of one of the great runs really and great stories in any sport at any time. People visiting grave sites of their grandfathers months later in New England. This goes on and on of what happened here. Veritek keeps it going. The celebration really, and as the Red Sox were in first place for the first most of the, the season, it was kind of a little house's money, never a huge lead, but it was just an enjoyable time. And the party continued, and right from the opening day here, and the ring ceremony with the Yankees in town, and it was just a, it was really a 12-month party. Shadow goes, doesn't matter. Veritek gone. El Duque, unbelievable. Red Sox down to one at bat. Back here at Fenway, almost imploring. New England's own Aerosmith. Dream on just played here at Fenway. Will the dream go on? We've hit the top of the ninth. The White Sox lead the champion Red Sox four to three. And if the score stands this way, which El Duque has had such a big moment and big contribution in doing, our Wheaties winning moment of the game would be Paul Konerko busting open the 2-2 tie with his long home run, two-run shot off of Tim Wakefield, the White Sox seventh homer in these three games. And that's the 4-3 lead. And if they gave out an MVP of the division series, which they don't, you would have to figure Konerko would get that. He homered in the first game. He got a hit in the second game. He homers again this afternoon. That's the end of the night for El Duque. I mean, even though he's telling Ozzy he's still got a little bit left, Ozzy said, you know what, you give me more than I could have even hoped for. Well, that means the 24-year-old Bobby Jenks will be on to try to finish this thing up. Well, they see Hermanson walking around, and there's Cots, but the Jenks have been up. Meanwhile, the closer, as it became as the season played out for Boston, Mike Timlin is in here in the ninth. Led the league in appearances, set a Red Sox record as he was on the hill on Sunday uh, for the last out. 81 appearances, a new team record. He's been a workhorse his entire career. Long time ago, won world championships with the Blue Jays. And here he is in Boston. He want me to set up. Do you want me to close? What do you want me to do? Give me the ball. That's what he does. A.J. Przinsky, Joe Creedy, Juan Uribe to hit in the ninth. But really what you want to know about is the Boston ninth, which will be Graffinino, Damon, Renteria, and due up fourth, David Ortiz, if somebody can get on. Now Tony will lead it off. He certainly would love to get another crack at it. New first baseman, by the way, Kevin Millar, since Ola Rube was pinch run for. Przinsky hits this one. It's a scrape out. AJ's going to try for two and get there. So AJ Przinsky with two homers ruined the Sox in game one. And he hits a double. AJ staying with his opposite field swing. 
And like I said, what you watch his follow through there. You see how in control he is. You see how his head's not moving. He's just getting that bat through the zone, sitting back. It's what we call locked in. I don't think we're going to be a sacrifice here, though, Boomer. I'll tell you why. The last three times Ozzie Guillen has asked Preeti to do it, he's gotten hit. He's gotten drilled. He got hit on the hand in the last time. That took him out. I think you might just let him try to hit the ball the opposite side. He's going to bunt again. How about Brzezinski? Four for nine, but some of the most impressive things that he did, we told you about the two homers, was moving runners over. We saw it today. We saw it in a big situation in game two. You said it, son. He's, he raised his game. He, Impressed, I'm like. Well, that's big, and having to catch the game as well. Yes. Yeah, so oh, by the He's way. He's working overtime. See, we just take that for granted. You, you <laughs> trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I see that part. Creedy does it this time. Millar will have to go into Graffinino. Sacrifice successful. Perzinski and insurance 90 feet from the plate. We saw this with Perzinski. In game two, when he pulled the ball, got the runner over, he applauded himself as he passed first base back, and that's what Creedy does here. The infield's in, deadens the ball off the end of the bat, hustles down the line, but as he gets past the bag, even he starts putting his hands together, and now he's high fiving with the rest of his team. And they see it, they appreciate it. I mean, your team really recognizes when you give yourself up for the good of everybody. That's another thing. Creedy telling Boomer and I last night, he said, he's not going to have me bunt again. I always get hurt when I bunt. Well, you know what? The situation mm -hmm. called for it, and they responded to what their manager wanted. Juan Uribe, one for three. Four hits in the series as well. Infield in to try to choke off this run somehow, some way. Boy, when you're an infield, you know the guy's hacking away. That's... Uh, Look for that mouth guard. And here as well, I mean, this situation, Timlin right away is going to try to expand the strike zone. He's got an aggressive hitter at the plate. Nibble a little bit, come off the edges. That was a borderline pitch out there. Mm -hmm. I think they yeah. may be thinking another bunt attempt here from Uribe. Hmm. He's a big insurance run. As a hitter, sometimes you know your blood pressure goes up a little bit, your adrenaline starts flowing, and you just like I said, you want to stay composed. Hit, look up to the look to the middle of the field. Try to keep the ball off the ground. If you do, you have to hit it pretty well to get through that hole. Hole is poor. Two and one. Krasinski faking like he was going there. I think that's what caused Timlin to pull that ball out of the zone. What, what we did a lot of times, Mike, you, you know, you're doing it as a catcher. You give something away. You know, a fastball slider doesn't matter, but if you see the runner take off or you hear the third baseman holler, there he goes, you just you, you get it out there where he can't reach it. Here he comes. Here it is. Timlin will try it. Safe. How about that with the catcher at third base? They run the squeeze, and the White Sox lead it 5-3. About that. He picked the perfect spot. He got the count in his favor. He got a breaking ball that was up that he could handle. Przinski, look at that. I mean, that's a great job. He didn't give it away. The pitch before he faked like he was going to go. He got Timlin to throw a ball. That time, it wasn't a fake. It was the real thing. And, you know, Ozzy would be the first guy to tell you, sure, he pushed all the right buttons. But you know what? This game is about players, and they have performed. Execution. Execution right there. Just get the ball on the ground. They've done it all right, haven't yeah. they? All right. Aggressive no matter what. Aggressive. At oh, and that ball gets away from Millar. Everything falling apart, Boston. And when you put pressure on the defense, you're going to get more mistakes. He wasn't even that far off the bag. He didn't even have a secondary lead and it just kind of I think the first baseman got tangled up a little bit with the runner. See. The White Sox doing things like squeezes the Red Sox a simple pickoff attempt comes up with an error. And again you know when they're this aggressive too, you force the defense to do things 
make more it throws to first Mike, base. you're exactly right. Teams in the American League aren't used to that. Yeah. That is National League style baseball. Scott put Sednik up. And these Red Sox fans. Well, 1918 a race. Now see the White Sox saying, well, see, we haven't been to a World Series. I know this is not over yet, and this is only one round, but 1959, one of their owners, Eddie Einhorn, who I uh, ran into in Chicago the other day, was a vendor at Comiskey Park during that World Series that they lost to the Dodgers. World Series before that, 1919. Raffinino charging. Over to Millar, two out, 1919, which was the throne World Series, allegedly so. And guys like Shoeless Joe Jackson, banned from baseball, a certain Hall of Famer, and others never back in the game. We got to go back to 1917 when the White Sox defeated the New York Giants to win the World Series. That's what they're after, what Boston got last year, racing everything from 19. They've had less chances than Boston, they didn't get in there very much. Talk about those years and you think about the history of this game, it's just fascinating. Well, what a huge run that is. Yeah. Yeah. Picked up in the top of the night. A one run deficit, the bottom of the night. That's no big deal in an elimination game from the Boston Red Sox. They were in that same position last year. And the White Sox don't have Mariano Rivera down there. That's what they had to come back off of against the Yankees. They did, and we know the rest. That second run right now, though, that is a huge cushion for Big Bobby Jinks. Not to mention the runner at third, a potential third run. But remember, Big Poppy do up fourth. If somebody gets on, if someone can do it, it would be your team. The Gucci strikes out. The Boston Red Sox down to their last gas to defend their championship. They'll face the youngster Jenks at the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Red Sox gave up a huge run to the White Sox here in the top of the ninth. And this dream of 12 months, this, this unbelievable story that will be told for generations here in New England. The reign of champion. It took 86 years to get one, and it may take one inning to end the hope of two. Kurt Schilling would go tomorrow. We never saw him in this series. And now the White Sox have had the relief of El Duque. They go from a senior citizen or a senior citizen to a 24-year-old gentleman, Bobby Jenks, who was in double A up until July. Now here he is, a two-out save in game two, Sut, trying for a, a one-inning save here in game number three. Chicago might not have seen Schilling up to this point, but the Red Sox saw enough of this guy in game two. Now you point out the guy that tagged him is the fellow with the plate in game two, Tony Graffinino. That's he hit the double off of Jenks. Can Boston get going? Graffinino, Damon, Renteria, and perhaps Ortiz and Ramirez. Such a gallant three year run. Win the whole prize last year. But the White Sox have their eyes on that prize. And they're just three outs away. You know, I mean, the big thing about the White Sox, what we've seen in the series, that they're not going to walk you. Marte was really the only guy wild, and they're, and they're not going to make errors. They're going to make you swing the bat. You're going to have to hit the baseball to beat them. They're not going to beat themselves. Slow chopper, Creedy. Canerco, one out in the ninth. Last year, a different story. Three in a row against the Angels, the epic cutback against the Yankees, and then Johnny Damon, the home run early in St. Louis. How early? Right away. The pitching of Boston, too tough against Pools. And then Cardinal Edgar Renteria makes the last out for the Cardinals as the Red Sox celebrate. Edgar Renteria could make the last out for these Red Sox in 2005. That's amazing. Johnny Damon. I guarantee you, Mike, Edgar Venturia knows that's going through his mind, too. He was here with Boston 
when the Red Sox got their rings for sweeping the Cardinals. So tough when you have a closer like this with great stuff. Well, you really don't know much about yeah, it, although, although so, they saw him. So tough to hit. You want to get a walk. You want a spark. You need a spark. You need base runners. Try and get to the big guys. Johnny Damon, the last time up with the bases loaded against Orlando Hernandez. And he went. The Chicago White Sox this year. 62 and 33 in games decided by one or two runs. He waved at that one, and now it is Renteria. That's the last Red Sox hope. I not only can hear the fat lady starting to sing, but I think the song is Chicago is my kind of town. But before we're going to hear it loud and clear, don't mess around with Renteria because if he gets on, You'll be able to hear this crowd in Chicago when Ortiz walks up. He swung at the first pitch in this situation in game two and ended it. Takes that one, but for a strike. Trying to do anything possible to get on base. Stick your ankle out over yeah, the plate exactly, or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Gucci Canerco the Red Sox dream to repeat is over and the Chicago White Sox have come into Fenway Park and completed a sweep here in the AL Division Series. They won three different types of games in this series and they have shown all of us why they had the best record in the American League and the valiant Red Sox a three year soap opera which hit the highest of highs now watches Chicago celebrate on the field and bubbly and sudsies ready to go in the visitors locker room. Congratulations to the White Sox and congratulations to the Boston Red Sox as well. They got a manager that's doing everything in the world right in Ozzie Ginn and to me what has not been known until now they have got the deepest bullpen by far of any team that's in the postseason right now. You can add El Duque to the mix of what already was solid. Speaking of El Duque, our Chevrolet player of the game, Orlando Hernandez, and it's got to be in recognition of his outstanding play. Chevrolet will make a thousand dollar contribution to the Boys and Girls Club of America. I think if they could continue to move on or get to the World Series, they're going to look at that sixth inning. When he uh, came in, bases loaded, no outs, was able to hold the lead um, as, as a true turning point. And a lot of people in Chicago, Boomer, asked me before the series, why didn't they keep Brandon McCarthy? He was pitching so well. He pitched great the last day of the year. Well, you know what? Ozzie Guillen knows more about his team than those people that questioned him. I think we're going to, you know, they're kind of a stunned crowd. They want to erupt as a thank you. But meanwhile, it's the White Sox who are celebrating, and Aaron Andrews down with the White Sox. Aaron? All right, Boomer, thanks so much. Paul Canerco, a White Sox that has been here, one of the longest here. You haven't won a playoff series since 1917. What does this mean to the underdogs, the White Sox? Well, it means we move on. Um, you know, but we're not done with, uh, you know, I know it looks good out here right now, but I don't think we're satisfied. I think we got the team. Uh, I knew if we can get by this first series, I think we match up well in the next series than anybody. So, you know, let's have at it. We just enjoy the night, enjoy the off time now, but uh, we're not, you know, our job's not done. Uh, we're going to try to take advantage of this. Ozzie Guillen told our guys upstairs once Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz tied it up, he said to relax. Then, of course, you come in and hit that two-run homer. Was that the key for you? Well, I, you know, I mean, I was just trying to, you know, J.D. had a great at-bat to get on before me, and um, the first couple of at-bats I was trying to force it a little bit off the knuckleball, which you can't do, and I just I just tried to let it come to me and, uh, you know, just let it go and see what happens. Orlando Hernandez, absolutely fantastic out there with the bases loaded, Jason Veritek and so on, couldn't get past him. Talk about what makes him go. Well, he's probably got the most heart of any pitcher uh, I've ever been around. Um, and, you know, that's the story of the night for me. Bases loaded, no outs against the best offense in the major leagues. And um, 
we come out of it right there. And, I mean, that's he's he's the uh, I mean whatever you want to say, he's the man for tonight. And um, you know who knows if they get some runs and win that game, we know how tough they can be here. And uh, you know we have nothing but respect for the, the Red Sox, and that's that. But we'll take it, and we're going to go on our way to the next round. Congratulations. Good luck to you. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Chris. All right, Aaron. Thank you very much. So Paul Konerko, who lived the first 11 years of his life in New England, albeit his, his father a Yankee fan. He might see that team. I think of Aaron Rowan, who said, man, I grew up a huge angel. He might see that team. But look, the Chicago White Sox have won eight games in a row now. They set their pitching rotation up. They get to start with just the way they want to do it on Tuesday. They have home field advantage, whoever they play next round. And because of the All-Star win, if they would win that, they'd have home field advantage in the World Series. It's set up for them as the bubbly flows in there and the head and hands in the stands. Boomer, I go back to two years ago when Ozzie Guillen was named manager here, and he told the front office, he said, you know what? You don't win the Kentucky Derby riding a donkey. I need some horses. Well, what he was talking about was the starting road. Rotation. They got that for him. On August the 1st, he had a 15-game lead. They started to fade. Everybody said it was the biggest collapse in the history of baseball. Ozzie Guillen said he had to get the whip out. He had to get their attention. He got those horses down that backstretch to the finish line. He told us when we interviewed him in game two, you're down four to nothing to David Wells. What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to get the whip out. Well, he is. He, he, he's whipping it up in a big-time fashion. And you see true teamwork. I mean, manager, players, coaches, everybody's pulling together right now. Everyone's knowing their role. Everybody's trying to do the little things to help teams win. And, and that's the energy you're kicking in right now, especially with the adrenaline, and it's coming through. Joe Creedy, earlier in the year on a sacrifice bunt, it hit him in the hand. He was out. All of a sudden now, you know what? We need you to bunt. I don't care if you break your hand again. You got to get it down. He does. And then, as you said, Boomer, you got the catcher at third base. You're not going to squeeze with him. He can't run. Well, guess what? We're going to try it. It worked. Uribe got the bunt down. They had the cushion. They go on to the American League Championship Series. Well, a lot of series. names that America's going to know. I mean, you, you know, they you don't know, although they voted in Pudzednik. Remember, to the All-Star game is kind of the, the extra fan choice, but Pudzednik. Rowan. I mean, Paul Konerko, for a guy that has 40 40 back to back seasons with home runs, they don't know him like you know Ortiz and Ramirez. You're about to right now. Aaron uh, has uh, Ozzie Guillen. Aaron? Thanks, Boomer. Oz, you said before this series, we don't deserve to be in the spotlight because we haven't accomplished anything yet. Well, you have tonight. Your thoughts? Well, I feel great. I didn't beat those guys. You know, it's easy for us to compete against those people. You know, they have a great lineup. It's an amazing ball club. Uh, the world champions. Uh, now we find out who's going to be the next world champion. But I, I feel good about the team. I think they play good. They execute. They pitch. They make the right pitch. And believe me, coming to Boston, you know, it's an easy thing to do. A huge decision made by yourself to bring in Orlando Hernandez with the bases loaded. Why El Duque? Because he's a guy with more experience. He's a guy that needs there for more experience. It's not easy to come here, bases loaded, no out in this ballpark. And uh, that's the biggest reason I did it, just because, you know, I wouldn't be the, you know, be the guy with the more experience. Rick Sutcliffe, Mike Piazza, making a little fun of you, saying you were working up a lather when that situation with bases loaded, Veritek, Graffinino, Daneman coming up to bat. What was going through your mind? Well, I just, hopefully they only score one and tie the game. I know when they take the lead because they got team lead behind, and uh, that's what I worry about. I think hopefully we bring Duke and say, just getting one run leave, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, lot, a lot of pounding in my heart, but, you know, I got to stay away from the player, let the players perform. you never a lack of words. What were you telling that umpire? <laughs> Wow, uh, everything, uh, everything. No, it's just, uh, you know, I respect the umpire, but he said it was a little too late to try to squeeze a guy. He was having a great day. And, you know, sometimes you, you're all acting over aggressive, and that's my job. Three days rest before you match up against either the Angels or the Yankees. What are your thoughts on either one of those teams, Oz? Wow, couple of good teams. You know, great, great team. To you. The party on in Chicago East, which would be Boston. By the way, you saw the gentleman behind. That was the general manager, Ken Williams. Another name that maybe some don't know, but they put themselves in a pretty nice, pretty impressive ball club and a pretty darn impressive job against the Red Sox. More from Fenway when we return.